Commissioner Teta. Here. Commissioner Poland. Here. Commissioner Cernick. Here. Commissioner Goldberg. Here. Commissioner Flagg. Here. Commissioner Onoron. Here. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is uh, communications. Um, I believe we have uh, Jenny Marsh, our assistant city manager, uh, sitting in uh, as her planning director role as well, I believe. Multiple, multiple hats. Good evening, commissioners. Nice to see you all this evening. Um, I do not have any communications to start off the meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, go over for everybody how this will work uh, as we um, have uh, public hearing items. So anybody who wishes to speak during a public invited to be heard, uh, which is items four and eight on the agenda, or during any public hearing items, which are agenda items six and seven, We'll need to watch the live stream of the meeting for instructions about how to call in to provide public comment at the appropriate times. Susan just posted those onto the screen. Um, so uh, comments are limited to five minutes per person and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior uh, to proceeding with your comments. Um, please remember to mute your live stream when you're called upon to speak. So, Item four on our agenda is the public invited to be heard. This is for anybody who wants to speak uh, to, a, uh, to something that is not on the agenda tonight. Um, we have public hearing uh, sections of each agenda item. This is for something that's not on the agenda. Public invited to be heard. Um, you need to call 1-888-788-5555. Nine, nine, which is a new toll-free number we're using. So it's 1-888-788-0099, and then enter in the meeting ID 862-0295-7430. That meeting ID is 862-0295. 7430. It takes us about five minutes uh, to process everybody who calls in and get you all set up correctly. So believe it or not, we're going to take a five minute break. We'll be right back.
Chair, we'll give the uh, viewing audience another 30 seconds and wait for the slide to disappear on their screens. I'm going to go ahead and let the callers in. So welcome uh, to all the callers that we've just let in. Give us just a minute and then we will call on you one at a time uh, by calling out your last three digits and then I will unmute you. Uh, you will need to say your name and your address before you speak. Um, is it three minutes, Chair? I... Um, it's five minutes five. Actually for us, yes. Okay, great. So you get five minutes in this one. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Oh, go ahead, Susan, sorry. I am ready to begin when you are. Okay, just a reminder uh, to those who are uh, going to make comments um, that this is for uh, items that are not on the agenda tonight. Um, and I have uh, my phone here, I'll be timing uh, your five minutes. So if we could, let's just take them top to bottom. We'll start uh, with uh, the phone number that ends in 447. Caller 447, go ahead and unmute. Can you unmute yourself? Let's try that again. Caller 447, can you go ahead and unmute? Just a reminder, please stop listening to the live stream because sometimes that'll confuse you. There's a 30 second delay. Hi, caller 447. Yeah, can you hear me now? We sure can. You may begin. Great. My name is John Pillman. I live at 1303 Spruce Avenue. And um, I have some um, items that I've raised uh, in several emails to Ava Pachersky um, regarding the proposed bond farm um, housing development. Is that appropriate for me to bring up those concerns? Um, let me just clarify uh, for everybody. Um, if you bring this up at this point in time, um, then it does not become part of the record for that, that item that will be heard. If you were to bring up your concerns when we're actually holding our hearing on that item, then your comments become part of the record for that specific item. So if that item were to be uh, appealed or go in front of city council, then your comments would be included in the record that went with that appeal. But if you speak now to an item that's on the agenda, then your comments are not part of that record that would go forward in an appeal process. Okay, then, then I definitely do not want to speak now because I want my, my comments to be on public record. Okay, very good. Um, we'll we'll uh, get to that once we get to that item. Thank you, sir. Um, Let's check in with a uh, caller ending in 795. Okay, and just one point of order. Um, once you speak, um, please go ahead and hang up or I will put you back in the waiting room so I can keep track of um, who's uh, spoken already. So I believe that was caller 447. So I'm gonna put you back in the waiting room. And looks like we lost 795. Um, yep. So it looks like 131. One, one. One. All right, caller 131. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Caller 131, there you go. Hi, um, I'm a little confused. I wanted to address Bond Farm. So should I also go to the waiting room? Yes, again. If, well, if, what? Yeah. Sure, give me just later. a minute. Let me say, okay. rather than hanging out in the waiting room, that can get confusing for us. So if you just, um, mm -hmm. if you just would hang up and wait for the live stream when we invite you to call back in, that would be the best. I see. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, Susan. So we have caller three five zero. Caller three five zero. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. Uh, do I do the video? Oh, sorry, Jean. I clicked on your name as things were moving around. Give me just a minute. I'm going to mute you again. Caller 350. 
you should be able to unmute. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Um, Jean, we're trying to get someone on that's called in. So I'm going to mute you again. I'm I'm looking for caller 350. Can I re respond to that? That's the, those are the last three numbers of my brand new phone number that I just got today. <laughs> oh, so are you in the meeting twice? I don't know. I'm just here to speak to the Bond Farm proposal. Right, but you're one of our applicants, so. Uh, okay, I think I understand what's going on. Ms. Jasmine, uh, um, you're wanting to speak to uh, the first item on our agenda, which is the co-housing proposal? Yes. Okay, if you speak now, then your comments will not be included in the public record for that item, because this is the public invited to be heard part of the meeting. Okay. Um, we need to open up the public hearing on that item first, and then we will have a section uh, of that item or the public will be invited to speak on that specific item. If you wait for that, then your comments would be carried forward in the record for that item, uh, if anybody ever looked for that in the future. Thank Do you, you want to speak now, or would you like to wait until we open up that item? I would like to wait, please. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So that would conclude our callers, except Jean is still in as a caller, and I don't want to remove her because then she won't be able to call back. So we'll just mute Jean and we'll leave her be. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, I will close the public invited to be heard. Thank you, everybody, for your patience with our technology. It's, uh, you know, we're all pioneering new things here. Um, next on our agenda is uh, approval of our minutes from our July 15, 2020 meeting. Any discussion amongst the commissioners? Any motion to approve? Um, remember to show me your video so I can see you if you're raising your hand. Commissioner Poland. I move that we approve the meeting, uh, the uh, <laughs> Excuse me, <laughs> approve the minutes for the July 15, 2020 regular meeting. Okay, motion to approve uh, the minutes. Uh, Commissioner Height, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to congratulate um, our recording secretary, Ms. Madrid. This is a, th these were very detailed minutes, um, but I do want to second uh, Commissioner Poland's motion. Okay, seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, let's just have a uh, Vote by hand. Those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions for not being present? Okay, so Jane. I abstain. Oh. I abstain. Okay. So Jane, that is uh, four in favor and commissioners Flagg, Teta, and Goldberg abstain because uh, they were not present at the meeting. Okay. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is the Bond Farm Community Co-Housing Preliminary PUD and Annexation Rezoning Concept Plan Amendments, PZR 2020-5 with Principal Planner Ava Parachewski. I need to disclose that um, I live in Old Town uh, on Grant Street. I am north of uh, 3rd Street, so I'm not part of the Bond Farm neighborhood. Um, I've had no ex parte communications about this agenda item. Um, all of my uh, decisions at uh, tonight's meeting will be based on the information that I hear tonight and that was presented in our packet. Um, all right, Ava. Please. I need to disclose oh. as well, sorry. Okay. Uh, in the past, uh, I worked with Peter Spalding in another uh, co-housing project in Boulder, uh, not this one. And again, regarding to this particular project, I didn't have any ex parte communication with Peter. And I believe I can use my best judgment for the rest of the community. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Onoran. Um, any others? Okay. 
Uh, Ava, let's hear your presentation. Thank you, uh, Chair Shernick and commissioners. Uh, Susan, would you mind queuing up the uh, PowerPoint? Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Ava Pehezhevsky, principal planner. Uh, this is the Bond Farm uh, co-housing preliminary PUD plan and concept plan amendment uh, discussion. Uh, I will try to make uh, my remarks brief because I know we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm just gonna give uh, the, the commission the background and the, uh, the zoning side of it. The applicant will discuss review criteria uh, compatibility and those type of things. Uh, so the, just to give you the background, it was in your packet. Um, this property is at 1313 Spruce Avenue. This is in the historic Bond Farm neighborhood that's south of Third Avenue and east of Sunset Street. And I apologize, but um, I can't, uh, you can't see my mouse. So you just have to look through the slides. Um, it's uh, just shy of six acres. The total property acreage uh, was previously a obviously a farm, um, and uh, there's an old har farmhouse, a residential home there, uh, constructed in 1900. Uh, it was annexed in 2006 uh, with the zoning of single family residential. Um, and the property to the properties to the north, on the north side of Spruce Avenue are all zoned residential single family. Uh, the parcels to the east and south of this project site are zoned residential mixed neighborhood, which does allow a higher density. Uh, it's kind of a transition zone. And then the parcel immediately west, uh, right there where it says Boco SR, that property is a residential, uh, some residential homes and uh, it's in unincorporated Boulder County. It's not in Longmont limits. Uh, it's abutting Francis Street there. And uh, th that is zoned uh, suburban residential. Uh, and so just from a historical standpoint, again, after it was annexed in 2006, a single family, uh, it sat uh, undeveloped uh, until um, 2015, uh, Peter Spaulding approached the city uh, talking about uh, doing a co-housing community uh, here. And since uh, the zoning for residential single family would not permit co-housing because it requires a detached house on a single lot, uh, they, they pursued a rezoning uh, to change that uh, from single family residential to PUDR uh, in our former uh, development code. As you know, we had PUD zones. Uh, the PUDR zoning would allow for some commercial mixed use that's tied into a residential use. And it also allowed other types of residential units uh, beyond single family houses, such as townhomes, condos, that type of thing. Uh, and so that went through the rezoning process with Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council uh, between 2015 and 2016, a very robust uh, public participation process. Uh, ultimately, and this did have the, the live work, what you see before you tonight is what was in the rezoning concept plan as well. It was with the live work commercial uh, facing Spruce Avenue and then the uh, multifamily and the single family homes kind of on the south and then the community garden on the south. Uh, and so that was all approved by city council in March of 2016. It had to be approved within a, so the rezone, all rezonings in the city, uh, when you apply for that, the rezoning ordinance would have a accompanying concept plan. The concept plan is essentially what you see tonight for the for the co-housing community. Uh, the reason the applicant is, and we're going to get to this in the next slide, but um, part of that concept plan in, included a, a proposed pedestrian trail on the west side. So again, I don't have my mouse, but it's uh, here on the west side, right adjacent uh, to that Boulder County property, and there was a pedestrian trail. I'll have a slide for that next. Uh, and then with that, uh, council approved an annexation agreement amendment, uh, again, because the original annexation from 2006 uh, didn't envision co-housing here. So uh, we amended the annexation agreement. So uh, tonight there's an amendment to that concept plan. It essentially looks exactly the same as the one council approved in the rezone, uh, but it eliminates that pedestrian trail, which I'll get to next. 
Uh, so, so in that rezoning, it was zoned residential PUD. Um, our zoning, our land development code uh, switched over uh, in September 2018 uh, to the current code, which, uh, as you know, we changed all the names of the zoning districts and eliminated most PUD zones. So in our current code, uh, the property is zoned uh, residential mixed neighborhood, which is um, consistent with these parcels here on the south and the west, which is again meant to be this transition zone. Um, but this project uh, application was submitted uh, right before we transitioned into the new zoning code. So uh, this project's being reviewed under the PUD residential regulations in the old code. Uh, this project is also being, although it's being evaluated under the old zoning code, it is being evaluated under the current uh, comprehensive plan, the Envision Longmont plan. Uh, and that's because uh, in 2016, when City Council adopted the current comprehensive plan, the ordinance uh, adopting it said that uh, the Envision Longmont plan now uh, replaces the old comprehensive plan. Uh, so. We're evaluating, evaluating this project under the current comprehensive plan, but under the old development code. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, just some background on the comprehensive plan where you see the red arrows, the property site, um, it's designated as mixed neighborhood um, and the surrounding land sort of on the south uh, and the east and west. Uh, this whole area south of Spruce Street is designated mixed neighborhood. Mixed neighborhood is meant to serve as a transition area between that single family and on the north and sort of more uh, higher density and commercial corridors. As you can see, south of the railroad tracks there, uh, we have the mixed use employment zone. So this is sort of that buffer between the single family and that more industrial zone south of the tracks. So within this uh, land use category, the allowable type it allows all types of residential uses. So single family, townhome, multifamily. Um, the density that's allowed in this area is between uh, six and a minimum of six and a maximum of 18 dwelling units per acre. So for this project site, and I'll, I'll get to it on the next slide, but um, although it's about six acres, uh, they're dedicating almost an acre uh, to the city for a public park. So uh, the net project site for developability is five acres. And so that would mean the allowable density is between 30 to 90 dwelling units. Uh, in the comprehensive plan, the uh, mixed neighborhood uh, land use category allows secondary commercial uses such as small scale office, retail and neighborhood serving uses. This is sort of where that mixed use component comes into play. And then uh, obviously, as you can see the yellow on the north side of Spruce Street and north of it, uh, this is all designated single family neighborhood in our comprehensive plan. Next slide. So um, there's two proposals. I'm gonna start with the first one on this slide. This is a preliminary PUD plan. Uh, the way the process goes is you go to Planning and Zoning Commission to get approval of your preliminary PUD and then uh, you come back and you do a final PUD and that's where we do really the, the fine tuning of the details of the engineering and, and the landscaping. So these, these are more high level uh, review. Uh, but there's two parts to this. The first part is a minor subdivision. As part of their annexation uh, agreement with City Council when they rezoned, uh, they were obligated to dedicate um, a 0.85 acre parcel to the city for a future park on the east side. So if you see this white rectangle here on the right side, that is the park dedication that's going to the city of Longmont. On the remainder, remaining five acres of the parcel, again, this is proposing uh, a co-housing community with 46 residential units total. Um, on the north side, which you see at the top of the, the big white rectangle at the top, um, that's a uh, mixed use building. It's about 46,000 square feet. They're proposing um, 24 condo units and then six live work units in which there will be about just shy of 6,000 square feet of commercial on the ground floor. That commercial again is tied to the live work units. So it's not, 
which you may think of as, you know, uh, a shopping center or something like that. These are live work type of businesses. Uh, and then within that building, there's a 67 space parking garage. Um, because it's co-housing, they are also proposing like a maker space, a community laundry area. Uh, and I'll let the applicant kind of go into detail about the uses inside that building, but that's the general uh, gist of that building. And then on south of that building, uh, we've got um, 12 units of townhomes, uh, as you can see, kind of uh, scattered around. And then um, sort of on your bottom left, there will be four single family houses. Uh, detached single family houses, um, they will all have their own parking as well. In addition, there's an underground community barn. Um, and then they're on the, well, on the south and around the property in aggregate, they, they are proposing oh, two and a half acres of common open space. And this includes a 16,000 square foot community garden there kind of on the bottom right and then an 18,000 square foot detention pond uh, for stormwater, and that's on the bottom left. Um, in addition, um, there will be 18 street parking sp spaces along Spruce Avenue. They'll provide a couple other spaces on this private driveway here that uh, where you enter in off Spruce and swing around. Um, the applicant, because um, in the interest of time, I didn't want to pull up the elevations as well. So the applicant is gonna bring up the building elevations and he'll discuss architecture compatibility. Um, but in reviewing this against the PUD standards, the project met all of the development standards in, that, in our old code, uh, except um, one minor thing, um, the city requires a uh, 30 foot landscape buffer um, on the west side. And they're essentially providing it. Um, there's way more than 30 feet on your west side of landscaping. However, um, as you can see, building E, that's that single family house way on the sort of the left edge there, it encroaches 28 square feet into that landscape buffer. Uh, but we've kind of detailed in the staff report um, why this would um, be all right for a modification because they have provided additional landscaping and mitigation in the form of, you know, providing uh, almost double the amount of required landscaping that would be required by code. And next slide. So the second part of this application is their concept plan amendment. Um, the, on your left there, the graphic, you will see this was the concept plan that was part of their rezoning application for the co-housing and uh, for this annexation agreement amendment. Um, and you'll see there on the left where the red circle is, uh, they had proposed a pedestrian trail that would lead you from Spruce Avenue and go directly south and kind of head toward uh, Isaac Walton Park. Um, the, in working through the, and this is part of the delay in, in this project review was, um, the applicant was trying to secure easements from adjacent property owners uh, to meet city requirements for this trail. Um, and over the course of several months of negotiations, it wasn't able to uh, get acquiescence. And the applicant is going to discuss further uh, his justifications for why um, he, couldn't, he couldn't make those negotiations work. Uh, in addition, um, as part of the traffic study, they did a, a pedestrian study, pedestrian volume study, uh, which indicated low pedestrian volumes. Um, and um, it's in the traffic study. I could also share my screen if you need it. Um, and I believe we sent it to you by email in the, in the document there. But essentially, it counted like between zero to nine pedestrians between morning peak hour and uh, up to seven pedestrians in the afternoon peak hour. That was at various locations. Um, again, that's in the traffic study, but they studied uh, pedestrian uh, data on Spruce Avenue and, and uh, all of the intersections around it. Um, the applicant in their PUD plan sh shows an alternative pedestrian route in which they use existing streets. And I apologize there for the graphics so small, but as you can see, they identified like four different routes. Uh, you can go all the way over to West, uh, over to Sunset. Uh, you can drop down at some of the other local streets and that's uh, within the PUD plan and the applicant will kind of go into that further. Next slide, please. 
And so as far as community input, um, this is, has been, a, like I said, a lengthy process. Um, between 2015 and 2016, we had neighborhood meetings, we had planning commission, and we had city council uh, to discuss this proposed rezone. And this, this exact project was what was considered. And it was the co-housing with the mixed use with the live work. Um, and, but then obviously we had to start the process over again after the rezone for this PUD plan. Preliminary PUD plans require a neighborhood meeting before you kick off the application. So we had a neighborhood meeting back in 2017. This was after the, a year, about a year after the rezone. It took the applicant about a year to get the detailed plans put together. Uh, there are about nine attendees. It doesn't include staff or the applicant. Um, the concerns that were raised are, as you can imagine, concerns about parking, traffic impacts, uh, architectural compatibility with the existing neighborhood. Um, how would they integrate and, and the limits of those commercial units that were proposed? Questions about the timeline for the city park, uh, questions about construction timing and the sort of the ownership and management of the co-housing uh, development. Uh, and then they came in, like I said, in, in September, uh, just before the, the, new cold, the new code took place uh, and submitted their formal application. And so we, we posted signs and we sent letters out again to the neighbors. Um, we got five letters uh, or emails and um, those were in the packet, but essentially one was in support, one was just sort of general questions uh, and three of them were opposed. Um, the concerns raised were uh, the, in, you know, integrating commercial uses into this residential zone, um, didn't like development in general. Uh, I think one letter said they didn't think mixing of socioeconomic backgrounds would work. Um, and so we went through, you know, our review process with the applicant. Ultimately, we finally got to this public hearing. Uh, so I sent notices out uh, earlier this month, August 6th. Um, before your packets went out, I got three letters and two phone calls against. Um, and so since that came in before packets went out, it should, be, it should have been in your packet, but it was generally concerns about traffic from the commercial, uh, the density of it and wildlife concerns. And then after your packets went out, I got seven letters. I know it says six here on the slide and that's because I gave my slides uh, to our IT manager before um, the end of the day. And so I got another letter. So actually I got seven letters uh, opposed and I believe Jane forwarded all of those to you on email. Um, but the, the same general concerns uh, about traffic and parking and the commercial compatibility concerns. And next slide. So again, since traffic was one of the main concerns, um, I just, one thing I wanna do is introduce uh, Tyler Stamey, our, our um, traffic engineering administrator and Caroline Michael, our traffic engineer, both were involved in the review of this traffic study. Um, their conclusions were, and they were similar to the conclusions raised when we brought the whole co-housing project for the rezone to council. Uh, they kind of based it on a potential of 50 units, even though this is only 46, they kind of, you know, try to be more conservative and added more units um, with some live work, and they did identify the live work components. Um, and they did include approximately 6,000 square feet of commercial. Uh, their conclusions were that this would generate 378 weekday trips at full build out. And then of those trips, approximately 35 morning peak hour trips and 39 peak hour trips would be generated um, during peak hours uh, from this project. And the report noted that the current level of service at the nearby intersections, and those were identified in the staff report, but uh, essentially spruce intersections with Sunset Street, Sherman Street, Bowen Street, and then that third and Bowen intersection, um, all of those operate at level of service B or higher. And the conclusion of the traffic study is that with these additional 378 weekday trips, uh, the traffic at these intersections would still kind of remain at this level until 2040. And that's whether this development goes forward or not. Um, and so when we get to Q&A, if you have questions about the traffic study, I'm sure Tyler and Carolyn would be happy uh, to take those questions. Next slide, please. Um, the ecological study. So um, 
as you know, in, the, in our code, it only requires applicants to study and look for federally protected uh, species, birds or plants. And so that's what this report did. And it was uh, turned in, you know, when the application was submitted in 2018. And then since so much time had lapsed, we had asked for an update. Uh, and so they gave us an update this year. So we got one in February. Uh, recommendations remained the same. Um, there was no uh, habitat for any federal or state protected species, birds or plants. Um, it did have a recommendation that the applicant uh, get jurisdictional determination from Army Corps because the Denio Taylor Mill ditch is, sits right on the North property border. And in case, you know, this project was gonna discharge to the ditch, uh, you know, they recommended we determine if this is a water of the U.S. that would need a 404 permit. Uh, so the applicant pursued that with the Army Corps and in your packet, uh, we got a letter in August uh, of 2019 uh, determining that no 404 permit was required for this project. Um, so it was not jurisdictional. Um, we do have Steve Ransweiler from the Parks Department. He's not here to speak on the ecological study but um, because uh, a portion of this property, almost an acre, is being dedicated to the city of Longmont for a public park, uh, Steve is here to answer any questions you have about the park development. Next slide, please. Um, and so in closing, again, I just wanna make it succinct because um, the applicant wants to do their presentation next. Uh, the, re the recommendation from staff is uh, resolution 5B which is doing two things for you. It's recommending conditional approval of this PUD plan on the condition that city council approves this concept plan amendment that removes the pedestrian trail, tra trail. And it also then recommends approval of the concept plan amendment uh, removing the trail with the finding that the applicant met the review criteria by providing a sufficient justification that they aren't able to make the trail work and there was low pedestrian counts. Uh, the next step after planning and zoning commission uh, is city council on the concept plan amendment for the pedestrian trail. Uh, that would require two readings of an ordinance. Um, the public hearing notices would be mailed out uh, to a thousand foot radius when that second reading of the ordinance is scheduled. Right now it's to be determined uh, because we're trying to get through this and we also have to work through the agenda with the city manager's office. So those dates will be forthcoming. And I believe, uh, next slide. Yeah, I believe that's it. So um, the applicant, Peter Spaulding, um, with the Bond Farm co-housing community uh, would be happy to make his presentation next. And then if you have any questions for either of us uh, to clarify anything, we're happy to take your questions. I also wanted to note one other thing. Uh, Chris Huffer from Public Works Engineering, uh, the administrator is here. Uh, if you have any questions about the utilities and uh, why it's been such a challenge for the applicant to get easements. So Chris is also here to answer questions if, if any engineering uh, questions arise. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Uh, let's go ahead with Mr. Spaulding's presentation. Good evening. My name, can you hear me? We sure can. Um, can we, should we unmute um, the architect and the design team so that they can also present with me? Or? They, they all should be able to. They just need to, there they go. Oh, I'm here. My name is Alex Gore. And then is Brian Horn here? Susan, did Brian join? The meeting? Yes, he's here. Okay, great. I'll ask him to try and unmute. My name is Peter Spalding, and um, I'm with Colorado Co Housing Development Company and the developer for this project. And I have Alex Gore and Brian Horan who will be joining us um, in this presentation. Um, Susan, uh, if you could go ahead and start the uh, PDF file. There you go. Um, so the general layout for this is I'm gonna go over some basic concepts for 
the co-housing community, what the product is, and then we're gonna get into the DRC comments, and then I'm gonna do some responses to the public comments, and then um, we'll conclude the slide presentation, and then we'll be open for any questions that you might have. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So here, um, this is the 46 unit plan development. Uh, it showcases um, the main condo building on the upper level. And then north of the private drive, we have three triplexes, um, townhomes, and then south of the drive, we have the four single family homes, the underground barn, and uh, another triplex. To the south is the contiguous land for farming, and then to the east is the future city park. Next slide. So <clears throat> the vision for uh, Bond Farm co-housing community is to live creatively in a peaceful relationships with one another, our neighbors, and our environment. We wanna create a multi-generational, multicultural community in a planned rural farm-like setting respecting everyone's need for private time and space while providing common facilities for an active, safe, and caring HOA. We are working towards affordable choices to reflect the social and economic diversity of our membership. An objective among the existing members is to create an environment that supports healthy living practices and to live independently among one another in a supportive and thoughtful manner. The existing buyers all believe in developing a community that's oriented around the cultivation and harvesting of agricultural systems to develop holistic systems that are sustainable and efficient and to celebrate art. Concepts that fit within the co-housing model are respecting the viewpoints of others, sustainability and healthy living practices, energy efficiency and smart growth plans, both micro and macro, to participate with the Bond Farm Neighborhood Association, and to integrate intelligent, strong, and self-governing protocols for the HOA. Next slide, please. <clears throat> for the greater community benefits, um, not only does the internal community, community benefit from one another and shared resources and knowledge, so does the Greater Bond Farm Neighborhood Association and the residents within and outside the city of Longmont. By collaborating with prior and existing co-presidents of the Bond Farm Neighborhood Association and neighboring families, we concluded that the best location for the future park was in the northeast corner of our site, which complements the existing Bond Farm Neighborhood Association park to the east of the future park. This decision-making process for the park location became the basis of the Bond Farm co-housing community concept plan. This was completed prior to the developer seeking buyers into the co-housing development. So in other words, I worked with the community first on the future park prior to starting the project. So you can imagine future block parties like Halloween hayrides, community Easter egg hunts, holidays in general, educational farming and art for students that relate to urban planning, farming and sustainability and more. Our programming is optimized for, this, for these events. The FCC is planning to offer associate memberships to the greater neighborhood so that they too can take advantage of Bond Farm co-housing communities, programming and amenities, such as recording studios, commercial grade kitchen, wood and metal shop, community events like art and cooking workshops and more. Next slide, please. The original concept of this uh, site was uh, agribusiness. So, um, we wanted to keep that uh, in true form. So we've developed a plan that's uh, based on a CSA and an art business model. So we'll be an organic farm to table community. Uh, we'll be offering excess shares and on-site programming uh, to associate members. Uh, the agribusiness, and this is part of the economic model that we're presenting, uh, the agribusiness and art will help to reduce HOA dues for the residents, which is uh, growing problem in Colorado and in housing. Based off of a 158,000 annual budget, our an average monthly bill will be $285 per household. Revenue generated from the CSA and art and other services being offered, we project that our dues will be reduced to on average $215 or lower. This model can help address the affordability issue for those with fixed incomes. 
educational opportunities for all ages uh, regarding our business, lessons on how to raise chickens, bees, bats, and how to farm for all ages. There will be no farmer's market at this location. The CSA is tailored for the buyers and for the associate members. There's plenty of art programming designed into the Bond Farm co-housing community and its architecture. And Bond Farm co-housing community has several maker spaces and a commercial grade kitchen that will help to launch a successful business plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a design review criteria issue. Uh, the first action our team accomplished was to host a meeting for the Bond Farm Neighborhood Association uh, for the location of the desired park. Um, as I mentioned, the decision was to locate it to the east. The addition of the city park will further Bond Farm co-housing community's agenda of minimizing the development's overall footprint, which was critical for sustainability. Neighbors will be able to visit the park with their four-legged friends and during off-peak hours, the wildlife will be able to take advantage of the site. This is a great opportunity also for Bond Farm and the neighborhood in the city of Longmont to collaborate on the designing and naming of the park. The city park will serve the neighborhood in many different and beneficial ways. We look forward to working with the greater community in the city of Longmont parks and natural resources to design and name the future park. And to the right, you can see some of the amenities of small parks. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn this over to um, Alex. Yes. All right. Hello. Thank you, everyone. Um, basically, what this picture is showing is that instead of having the path to the west side, the Bond Farm community has uh, agreed with uh, city and planning to pay for the construction and the maintenance of a new access to the east, basically off of Spruce and Grant. So that is a picture that's really a blow up picture of that intersection where that light gray uh, squiggly line will be a new path that's ADA related, uh, that has ADA grading. Uh, why we can't do the path on the other side, there's multiple reasons, but one is um, this: the site is sloped too much. Um, concept, you know, four years ago is different from getting grading in and everything else. So it would be a very steep path where this path to the east allows to access um, the parks and the other, uh, the other sidewalks um, in a more safe manner. Also, as Peter has pointed out, and in the slide that you've seen before, there's four other ways to access the, the parks. Um, besides that, too, the, that access uh, path that is, can no longer be built uh, is because it was uh, it couldn't be agreed with the, the property owner to the east too, so it wasn't even on the site. So if we go to the next slide, we can see one reason why. Um, in the concept plan, it initially started as a five foot, uh, a five foot nice path. And because of uh, all the, everything that was needed with water, with drainage, with being able to access, um, if there was, it, it grew to be 10 feet. Um, and that really puts a burden on, on the neighbors to the south. And they've actually agreed to this, to this section, um, which is very gracious of them. Um, but to continue that through to the steep site um, and, and have a, a large path that goes through that isn't in the theme of the design and the character of Bond Farm, um, which, has, which is broken up nicely. Um, it, the, the scale is wrong and then also just the steepness of it uh, won't work either. Um, so, um, and then we just like to thank the homeowners that did help with this, this drainage part and, and all the issues that we had to do there to the south because they really helped put this, put this together. Um, but the, the path essentially on the site will not work for those other reasons. If you could go to the next slide. So that was one of the main issues was the path. And then the second issue is this encroachment into the landscape buffer. Uh, it's a very small encroachment. It's, it's not even a, uh, takes up a large portion. It's just a triangle shape. The reason for this is you can see that we're kind of sandwiched between a utility easement and this landscape buffer. Um, so to mitigate this, not only can we provide more plants around there and throughout the sites, 
but on the other side of the property is a 15 foot easement. So uh, essentially we, this is meeting that buffer. It's just a small technicality um, in this little area where we're asking the planning and zoning commission to, to use their good judgment and, and allow this to. Um, Peter, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, no, that sums it up, I think. And then, yep, next slide. And I think transportation will take over. Yeah, Brian Horn. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. The, um, as was mentioned by uh, staff, the site is forecasted uh, to generate minimal traffic volumes and is consistent with the zoning. Um, as was mentioned during the staff presentation, uh, a max use of this land would be uh, 90 uh, dwelling units, and that would be 30% approximately more traffic than um, what we're proposing. Um, also, as mentioned, the traffic study was conservative. We didn't take any reductions for the synergies between the, um, the commercial and the residential. We evaluated those as, a, as if they would generate their own traffic, which in practice, there would be um, some reduction between um, the two of those. Um, we had a number of discussions um, with staff about placement of uh, traffic calming, um, which is required in the code. We were uh, able to find uh, an ideal location for that. Uh, additionally, the on-street parking uh, will create uh, an element of friction, um, which will reduce speeds along this roadway. Um, also, as mentioned by staff, uh, with or without the development, the build out and long range uh, 2040 conditions um, are uh, insignificantly different. Um, again, all intersections operating at level of service C or better. Um, uh, for those uh, unfamiliar, uh, levels of service are graded on an A to F scale. Um, so C is pretty good. Um, and then also, you know, because traffic volumes that we're generating are, are relatively low, um, our contribution to the surrounding intersections are less than 3% um, in total future conditions. Um, and uh, you can see a note there that uh, Spruce uh, has remaining capacity um, and we're uh, contributing to about 3% of that additional capacity. Next slide, I believe. Okay, next slide. Um, so to go into public comment responses, uh, there are six single level story live work units that are gonna be between 890 to 955 square feet and they're one story. They're tailored for small mom and pop businesses. A live work unit, uh, just so for the public that's listening, would comprise of roughly a 400 square foot living space and approximately 500 square feet for workspace. And those configurations are a little bit variable, but these businesses essentially have to be small because their workspaces are gonna be small. Uh, these single story live work unit ceiling heights are nine foot as far um, as are the units above on the second story, the residential units. The only difference is that the upper level units have sloped roofs over the dining areas. Um, so that gives it a little bit of an elevation change, but that was an architectural aesthetic decision that we uh, chose. So the overall building height ranges from 19 feet to 25 feet in height, which are similar to, if not less than other residences along the south side of Spruce Avenue. Refer to slide 28 of the PUD plan to verify these elevations. Next slide, please. Um, this is the perspective of, um, you know, of the live workspaces and the courtyard. Uh, this shows sort of how we've broken that building apart so it's not monolithic. And in the very background, you can see the elevator shaft that goes down from the parking level to the second story. We sort of have a sky bridge and in the foreground, you're seeing four of the live work units and above those live work units we have green terraces and in those terraces we'll probably have um, dwarf trees which we're actually growing right now uh, so the look and feel for the architecture is going to 
really soften in that area and we believe it'll be a great multifunctional use uh, which formally breaks the building in two. Um, it'll be a nice opportunity for future block parties and gatherings uh, for the neighborhood and other events. Next slide, please. Um, so the type of businesses, you know, there are some concerns um, about what kind of businesses would be coming in here. And as we identified, these are essentially going to have to be small businesses. So we're willing to write into our declarations that we wouldn't allow for any liquor stores, dispensary, pawn stores, predatory lending services and the like. But examples of what we would promote would be arts, crafts, gallery, yoga, IT, a workspace hub, a mini tinker mill, massage therapy, psychotherapy, physicians, boutique mom and pop businesses, florist, catering, chiropractor, dentistry, law, developer, contractor, educational, various nonprofit organizations, and many other entrepreneurial practices that are legitimate. Having this type of diverse talent in any given neighborhood benefits everyone. It also showcases the City of Long Island Planning's LCAP goals of housing diversity by adding this housing type to their housing inventory. There are nearly 200 co-housing communities across the United States and thousands across the globe. Co-housing is a proven housing model for people interested in seeking to live in an open gated like environment. This is a very successful housing type that offers various benefits and opportunities. Co-housing is relatively new. Its inception to the US was in the mid eighties. And like humans, no two co-housing communities are the same. They're all unique. Their uniqueness is developed and celebrated through their diversity. Next slide, please. This sort of gives you a perspective um, from uh, Spruce and Grant. So this is a Northeast to Southwest perspective. Um, you can see where the roof line breaks up. Those are typically dining areas. Um, we're using a batten board style on top of concrete, which is very popular um, in agricultural communities and rural communities. Uh, the main building is not a monolithic structure. We have really, the architects have worked really hard um, on pushing and pulling on the building and breaking it so that it does give more, a more of a neighborhood uh, style. Um, the only difference in this, uh, this uh, rendering is that you see the diagonal parking, that's no longer there. We're actually doing parallel parking along that area. So there'll be actually more green space between the uh, parking, the parallel parking and the building itself. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see from the aerial, uh, the park is closest to us, that's to the east, that's the Future City Park. And it's important uh, for these DRC comments to understand that from the south boundary to the north boundary, there's a uh, 30 foot elevation, it's actually more, but a 30 foot elevation change from the south to the north. Um, and that's where we really got into big challenges uh, with the North-South Trail. And uh, with the future park and with the contiguous land uh, for farming, we'll have 46% of the development in green space. Next slide, please. The common spaces, and this goes towards the associate memberships that we're gonna wanna offer to the greater community. We have a wood and metal shop, bike repair, a recording studio, greenhouse, Farming, approximately two acres, maker spaces, indoor outdoor dining for potlucks, commercial grade kitchen, flex spaces for social events, centralized math mail, two guest rooms for uh, the community, and um, the development of the associate memberships for the greater community, and more. Next slide, please. Walkability, bikeability. We are very interested in increasing our walkability, bikeability score. So BFC members understand and promote the importance of walkability and bikeability, which is why the mixed use component is so valuable in the neighborhood. Offering those type of services, neighbors can walk to those services rather than get in their car and generate trips. With all that is programmed into the BFCC development, homeowners have less reasons to leave the site, making their lifestyles more efficient. So while we were showing standard trip generations from other housing models, we believe that we would actually be generating less trips in and out of our site. Due to the site's location, we have plenty of opportunities to walk or bike to downtown Longmont 
for services to open green spaces and other local amenities. All this helps to reduce with vehicular trips in and out of the site. And BFCC is also developing a car share and carpooling program to further reduce trips in and out of the community. Next slide, please. Lastly, about being a good neighbor, all the points that we were speaking to in this presentation help to make us good neighbors do the programming that we're bringing to the community and the level of collaboration and opportunity that we're creating on and off site. On the last Sunday of every month, the Bond Farm Co-housing Community offers a public presentation from 3 to 5 p.m., including a site walk. Due to coronavirus, we are offering this presentation online through Zoom meetings. And we've been doing this from the inception of this project. For more information, please visit our website, www.bfcc.me. All of our contact information is there and I encourage you to contact me if you don't fully understand the project. Uh, this is to the public. If you're a resident of Palm Farm Neighborhood Association, please stop by, we'll answer any questions. And lastly, we'd like to thank the City of Longmont planners, the department officials and for taking the time to work with us to help create Longmont's first co-housing community. And now we're open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. Um, any uh, questions from the commission at this time that are just to clarify anything that, that, that we just heard in the two presentations? I don't see any anybody raising their hands at this time. So it does take us a while to bring the uh, the public in for their their public comments. So let's get started with that process. Um, so Susan will uh, put our our screen back up uh, for the call in. So now is the time for those who want to make comments about the Bond Farm uh, co housing project um, to call in to one eight eight eight. 788-0099. And when you call that number, enter 862-0295-7430. So it's 888-788-0099 and enter 862-0295-7430. Thanks to the public in advance for your patience with this process. I know it's a little bit laborious, but um, we're gonna take another five minute break as uh, Susan and uh, Heather and Jane, our expert uh, city staff, uh, manage all the details.
Chair? Yes, Susan. We're going to give our live stream audience a few more seconds and wait for the slide okay. to catch up with us. I'm going to admit everyone who's in the waiting room. Looks like we've got about 14 guests. Great. So for all of you that just joined us, please give us a few minutes and we will get started. We will call each of you individually one by one by the last three digits of your phone number. I will ask you to unmute the phone and state your name and address before you speak. You'll have five minutes to speak. Um, the chair will be timing you. When you're done, you're welcome to hang up or I will put you back in the waiting room and you can hang up after that. That's just so that we can keep track of all the different numbers here. All right, looks like that slide cleared the live stream and I'm ready to begin when you are, Chair. Okay, uh, Susan, let's start with number 047. 047, do you hear us? Can you unmute? And one more tip, please mute your live stream if you're still listening to us. 047. Hi. Hi, can you turn off the live stream audio? Because that's going to confuse us. You got it. All right, sir. You may begin. Oh, okay. Hi, this is Kyle Swanson at uh, 187 Grant Street. Um, and I just had a question about uh, the uh, residents who abut the property, if there were, were any plans for a screen or any type of good neighbor fence or, or something that goes along the property line. So that's my question. Okay, um, we, we don't actually do a, uh, a back and forth Q and A uh, during this, so, but we will note your question and, uh, and I'm sure we can uh, get an answer to that for you, sir. Is there anything right. you'd like to, to state at this time? No, no, that's it, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Susan, we'll go to 060. Caller 060, I'm going to unmute you. Can you hear us? Caller 060, I'm asking to have you unmute. There you go. OK. Can you hear us? Hi, thanks. This is, yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. you may begin. Great. This is Doug Jones. I'm at 243 Sherman Street, just up the road from the Bond Farm. And um, I'd just like to address Mr. Spaulding. I appreciate the project, and I think it is a strong project, and we're glad that a um, project like this is there instead of a large um, apartment complex that could actually be there or anything else that could be there. So we're appreciative of that. Um, one thing I'm very concerned about is the, um, the challenges of the trail. And that was one of the big sellers for us to approve that project down there. Um, I think bringing that trail into our community and having it accessible as the park and having access from, you know, our neighborhood through there and down to the path um, there on off of First Street is critical to the success of your project and to, you know, allowing the community and the co-housing group to kind of come together. So I think that's a really critical thing and I do not think that the project should go ahead without um, having that trail in place. And the other comments I have are about the architecture. Um, the, I think the board and bat is okay. It's not great. You're seeing a lot more of that um, modern design in the, in the area, but um, I don't think that it's very as appropriate as it, as, a, as it could be to the style of the architecture that is currently in the neighborhood. And the thing that I'm really opposed to are those huge white banded roof lines that you're showing along with the white banded, uh, you know, 
planter bases or whatever I saw on that elevation, it gives it a really industrial kind of strip mall type of look. And sure, you can cover up with plants and things like that, but really that kind of style right there is just, I don't think, appropriate at all for what um, for what you guys are trying to accomplish and especially not for the neighborhood. So those are my two comments on that. Um, again, I do appreciate the project there. And I think you guys are doing a good job of, you know, talking to the community and being as transparent as possible with us. So I want to encourage that and tell you that we hear that, but also um, those two items with the trail and then the, and the architecture, I think really could be improved. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, Susan, let's move on to number 447. Caller 447, I'm asking you to unmute. Can you hear us? Caller 447, there you go. Can you hear us? Can you hear me now? We sure can, you may begin. Great, this is John Pillman. I live at 1303 Spruce Avenue. So my house faces on Spruce. I have, I have a couple of concerns really centering around traffic. Um, number one is, I'm, I'm really curious, um, and I just wanna log this, um, why was the traffic study done in the summer versus some other time of year when school is in session? Because as anybody knows, there's gonna be more traffic when, um, when school's in session, there's school buses, and there's various people driving their kids to and from school, et cetera. So I'm a little concerned about when the uh, traffic study was done. Um, second thing is I did a little research and we, we have approximately, give or take, 120 housing units that either face Bruce Avenue or uh, face various, or on various streets that really have no other choice than to exit on the Spruce Avenue, streets like Donovan, Judson, et cetera, south of, um, south of Spruce. And this would add, in my estimation, about 35% increase to housing units that of, of people that would need to use Spruce Avenue to get anywhere in Longmont. Um, I'm a little bit stymied as to why um, the projections are so low when a 35% increase in housing units that exit on the Spruce seems um, pretty, pretty sizable to me. So I, I really question that. The second or the third thing is um, the ADU impact. So Longmont is very ADU friendly now. Um, we're going to see, and I'm sure that the council is seeing a lot more applications for ADUs. Um, in fact, one of them I think is going to be discussed tonight. And um, that in and of itself without this project is going to add density to Longmont um, and certainly density to the area around Bond Farm. So I'm a little curious as to um, why that's not really being discussed to the manner that I believe it should be, because it's going to certainly have an, uh, a negative impact on, on the traffic on, uh, on Spruce. Um, the other thing I want to point out is, you know, Spruce has no dedicated bike lanes. Um, it has sidewalks that were more of an afterthought. Um, so, um, and, and in fact, Spruce um, isn't even the same with long Spruce. If, it tends to be wider as you get closer to Bowen. When you get over to Sunset, Spruce tends to be a little bit narrower. Um, we have parking on both sides of Spruce. And if anybody's ever traveled on Spruce very much, like I have, um, you're gonna find that um, there are many times when if cars are parked on, parked on both sides of Spruce, you, um, you literally have to pull over or back up to allow another car to come in the other direction. It's just Spruce is just a real, a real mess as it is without the impact that this is gonna have. And the other thing I wanna to mention too is that um, we've seen, you know, I, I would call it the COVID effect. Um, the number of UPS, FedEx, Amazon trucks that travel up and down Spruce um, has always been an issue, but certainly since COVID and people buying things and having things delivered, Grubhub, you know, you name it, right? The number of trips um, is, in from what I've seen looking out my window here, <laughs> and certainly trips that have been made to my house to deliver things has increased astronomically. So there are just a number of factors here that I think are taking um, a precarious situation with Spruce to begin with, and I really think are amplifying that. And I think adding a 35% 
increase in housing units that exit on a spruce. I think um, without some sort of um, some sort of um, redesign or some sort of, um, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but I can tell you right now that, that, that Spruce, the way it's currently running and designed without either widening or out without, uh, you know, I don't know if it's stop signs or speed bumps or something, we're really asking for trouble here. So, um, and I should know from a person that lives on Spruce and has lived on Spruce for quite a while. And, um, and Ava has all my other comments. I've, I go in a lot more detail, but I want to keep this short so others can contribute. But um, just wanted to make that clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Spielman. Um, next is number 519. And Chair, I just have one comment. Oh, yeah. I did not lock the meeting before I uh, began uh, letting callers speak. So I let one other caller in. OK. OK. Caller 519, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Caller 519, can you hear us? Your phone number ends in the three digits 519. All right, I'm gonna move on. They may be listening to the live stream. Caller 525, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Caller 525. Hello. I'm Jean Jasmine. Can Hello. You... Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear uh, what One moment, please. We've got two callers going. Jean, I'm going to let you speak. And caller 519, I'm going to put you back on mute. We'll get back to you. Go ahead, Jean. OK. Um, I am. Uh, a totally thrilled person about the Bond Farm co-housing community. Um, Ms. 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 Jasmine, uh, could you state your name and address for the record first, please? I'm Jean Jasmine, 210 and a half Lincoln Street, Longmont, Colorado. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, I've been a, in volunteer service it, through all of my professional uh, career and my focus is in getting people to get together, uh, share their skills, share their concerns, then their needs and their abilities to help. And um, one Sunday I had heard about the Bond Farm uh, co-housing community development and because I lived two blocks away from it, I decided to walk up and see what it was all about. And um, I have, I've been a widow since I was 31 and raised my kids by myself. And I've been um, happy with an independent life, but uh, it's it got to be a point where I would like to share my life with others. And I walked into the um, on farm uh, lawn and Peter was there with uh, a table of about eight or ten people all talking about the development and um, it sounded like um, something that I could not um, believe was really happening. It was like a triple A win for me. Agriculture, animals, and art all around a community that's sharing and supporting each other and allowing us to develop skills and interests that we didn't know we had. And um, as we get older, there, uh, there's a need to have little kids around, have teenagers in our um, community that we can um, interact with them and we can have the support and give the support that we need when we're uh, getting older. So um, the opportunity to have a place uh, that supports others and, is, as, and to be supported, um, a place to learn new skills, a place to contribute to a healthier, greater environment, uh, and neighborhood and a place to form friendships through participating in common interests and activities 
I thought that was just a fine idea. And I'm real excited about Peter's focus on um, sharing what we have with the greater neighborhood as well. So um, right now, Bon Farm has no central gathering place. And so I'm a representative of the NGLA um, uh, Neighborhood uh, Group Leaders Association. And unlike uh, smaller communities that have uh, places that they get together uh, on a regular basis, we don't see each other usually until we have our block party, which Peter hosts on the Bon Farm co-housing community property, which is, uh, uh, it has become like a central gathering place and people like it a lot. Besides that, they come and walk their dogs and the uh, interaction with pets that some of us don't have is really another um, real nice uh, addition. So um, the all of the things that that Peter explained, I won't go over again, but they make the future of people who have little kids and people who are professionals and people who are older. It makes life really enjoyable and exciting. And so I am really, really happy to be able to be a part of it. Thank you. Oh, I'd like to say something about the traffic, the concerns about uh, more traffic. Uh, and that is that many of us who are older uh, have decided not to have cars and just share cars with others and go on group um, buying shopping excursions down to the mall or whatever. So uh, I think that is a consideration. Uh, and driving in ice and snow is not preferred um, for us either. So that's something we've been talking about. Thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you, Ms. Jasmine. Um, Chair, our next caller is 519. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Caller 519. I'm going to move on. Caller 795. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Please make sure that you've turned off the live stream or you're going to be about 30 seconds behind whatever I'm saying in your ear. Caller 795, there you are. Hello, Hello can, can you hear me? We sure can. Please All state right. your name and address. Uh, my, name, my name is Megan Williams. I live at 1213 Spruce Avenue. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Williams. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to speak to the same kind of concerns that have been already uh, addressed as far as traffic. I too think that the projections that they've come up with are really low. Um, I've been living on Spruce Avenue since uh, 03, so 17 years now. I've seen incredible increases in traffic on this road since I've lived here. Um, particularly, it seems like it really upticked after the flood and they did the reroute um, because of Boston being sort of a mess and they rerouted on Spruce and we just got a ton more traffic and it seems to have never gone away ever since um, that happened. So I think that their projections are really low. I also have concerns that that traffic study was done in the summer. Uh, I have little kids and I do a lot of walking and biking um, up and down Spruce and to Feeder Street. Um, I would echo the fact that the sidewalks around here are pretty horrible already. They're very narrow. Um, they're not well upkept. They've, um, they have hidden corners, things like that. It's not very good already. And with an increase in traffic, I've just, I've got some significant concerns um, about that. I feel like um, Spruce Avenue is not a 
good feeder street. We keep talking about Spruce being sort of the main thoroughfare of traffic. It's this street was not intended to be a feeder street for this many uh, people. It's not in great shape. It does, like uh, folks said, it narrows at one end, particularly down by sunset. It gets extremely hard to pass people uh, down by the multi-housing um, unit close to Spruce and Sunset. Um, I would echo what was said that you I often, probably at least once a day, I have to pull over and let somebody pass. You cannot have two-way traffic on this street because it is very narrow. Um, the, uh, the intersection at Spruce and Sunset often will get backed up all the way to Spruce from the stop sign at 3rd. So if I want to uh, take a right or a left onto um, Sunset from Spruce, I, I can't even do that because the traffic has already come all the way back down the hill um, from that stop sign on third and um, sunset. So I think that that would get uh, way worse. I also um, have concerns about that trail going away. Um, we access that trail all the time. We, we head down to the Greenway all the time and that um, having not having that feeder to get down there, um, I'm pretty concerned um, that that, I, I do think that that's critical. Um, to making this whole thing happen. Um, I, I got to say that it, it sounds like um, it, I was a little disappointed in listening to the presentations. It kind of sounds like people's minds are already made up um, coming from city staff. I would just ask that you continue to listen to your constituents um, in this area. Um, continue to listen to our concerns. Uh, I know it's gone through a number of these um, these processes are ready, and and I do I do appreciate uh, Peter's um, uh, willingness to reach out to the community and his transparency. I think he's done a great job with that. I do think that you have to um, continue to listen to the concerns of the public, though. Um, we've got some pretty strong concerns, particularly about uh, the amount of density and traffic and people that it's going to bring to the neighborhood. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Susan, should, should we try 519 again? We sure can. Give me just a minute. I've okay. got a lot of juggling I'm doing on my end. Sure. <laughs> Caller 519, let's try you again. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Can you hear me? Caller 519. Okay, I will move on. Caller 902. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Caller 902. There you are. Hello. Hi. Yes, we hear you. Hi. Um, yes, I'm at 197 Francis Street. And your My name? name is Moana. Moana Crushwitz. Thank you. You may begin. Okay, thank you. So similar to the last caller, I'm kind of um, uh, same topic, so I'll try to go through them quickly since they've already been addressed. One thing I do, I'm very excited to hear about the plans. I do want to thank um, Peter and his, you know, the idea is definitely better than it could be other things, right? However, similarly, um, I live right on Spruce, um, and I have the traffic issue that was just described is unbelievable. Sometimes, I mean, there's a retaining wall basically on the north side of Spruce, almost all the way down to Sunset. And so people are basically pulling over all the time to get around each other. It's like a country road is almost the impact. Um, and then we have a, a, a charter school at the end of Sunset as well that causes, there's drive lines or whatever. There's a lot of, of families that come down, I think, on Sunset. So you really can't turn out a lot of times in the morning. Um, and or turn up or down sunset from Spruce. So I do think it's, it really needs to be looked at. It's also pretty scary for kids and pedestrians and I mean, just to cross the street is really hard. So I am very concerned about the density, the high number of units. Um, I really wish it was a world where we didn't have to quite do so many. Uh, I get the pressures, but I'm very concerned about that. The other thing I just want to tell you, I, I watch people from my deck walk up and down that path constantly. Um, I really do see a lot more than seven or nine 
And so that saddens me because I do, it's just a really nice place. Like people are really um, walking their pets and looking at the grass and doing stuff. I mean, I, I, I don't totally agree with that either, the numbers, but I get, you know, a study is just a sample. So um, the other thing I really do, I'm concerned about the architecture, which I probably, I already came into the office one time and talked to you guys about it. But I, I do think for people don't live in old town, I mean, I get the modern is on trend and stuff, but we don't live here for that. So if there's a way to blend it a bit, that just would mean a lot to the community. I think people don't move here. We There's quaint bungalows down here. So I really don't, I don't get that, but I love the idea and the concept, you know, and I think that it's like, if there's a way to, to um, blend a bit better and, and acknowledge the actually where the neighborhood is, that would be really important, I think. Um, <clears throat> I think that's the main thing. Uh, turning left, let's see, I made notes. <laughs> I think that's, let's see. Those are the main things. Just the density is really high for this little tiny road. I mean, it's true what the woman said before about the flood traffic. I think that it um, really increased right after that. And then people sort of got in the habit of going down Spruce and it's pretty fast and there's a lot of people. And also the, the shipping, shipping trucks too. That's all I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kreshwitz. Um, Susan, I guess we'll go to 90, uh, or that was 902. How about 988? Caller 988, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Don Russell. I live at 207 Judson, just uh, about a uh, few hundred yards from uh, the Bond Farm project. I've been going to these meetings now for years and these comments tonight are pretty much the same as have been brought forth before various boards and council for the last at least two years. Same comments with respect to traffic and density. So there's no point in my belaboring what others have spoken of tonight. Uh, the, it, it appears to me at least uh, that uh, Planning, Planning Commission and Council haven't listened to our comments, the citizens' comments with respect to the size and the density and the bulk of this project. A 46,000 square feet, excuse me, a 46,000 square foot building, if I'm correct, along the uh, north boundary of this project. Does anybody there know how big a 46,000 square foot building is? That is a big building. Current traffic, I don't need to speak to except from the standpoint of being a cyclist. I ride many thousands of miles a year. I ride up and down Spruce Avenue almost <clears throat> on a daily basis. When I come in or go out on the sunset, I fear for my life. Four or five days a week, I fear for my life. Now, you could say that's because of the traffic on sunset but it's getting in and out of Spruce that scares me, particularly with the development right at the intersection there and cars parking on both sides. Uh, <clears throat> the term for uh, those of us also in the profession of architecture have a term for the, the architecture as presented on this project. Um, I call them Revit boxes uh, after the software that they're probably being designed or developed with, Revit boxes, giant Revit boxes especially with considering the type of siding and everything else. This project is too big for this neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Susan, I um, guess we're moving on to 073. Yes, caller 073, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Caller 073, can you hear me? You should be able to unmute yourself. I'm gonna go on to the next caller. We'll get back to you. Caller 985, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. If you look at your device, you should see a pop-up. Caller 985.
Not sure what's going on, Cher. I'll try the next one. Sure. Caller 131, I'm going to ask you to unmute. There you go. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Nettie Penman, and I live at 609 Collier Street in Longmont, and I've lived here for 13 years. And I am a member of Bond Farm Community Co-housing, and I'm calling in support of the project. And um, I was attracted to Bond Farm because it's a community built around shared interests of gardening and art. And I have worked with clay as a sculptor and a hobbyist potter for the last 50 years. And um, as I'm aging, I realize that sharing what I've learned and sharing my tools and craft are important to me. And um, Bond Farm will give me an opportunity to do that. And among the current members of Bond Farm are potters, stained glass artists, metal sculptors, woodworkers, jewelry smiths, and others. And um, I'm excited to know that uh, I hope someday to be living with neighbors who are also artists and want to share and collaborating on art projects. And um, Peter has worked really hard on developing spaces to accommodate working with all different mediums and um, encourage sharing ideas and um, plans for making this a reality. Um, we're, we're planning to have both interior and exterior walls that will be used for display space. And um, We've planned different rooms of the common space to be used for um, art making spaces for kids and adults. And they'll be equipped with things and tables and storage areas and lots more display space. So um, part of being a Bond Farm member is uh, we have different committees within the community and um, people who become members are asked to sign up for one or two committees. And so I, of course, signed up for the art team. And um, currently we're working, the art team is working on creating a gate that will be right between the two um, condo buildings that are on the north side of the development and the space between, that opening between, will be a gate that will be hopefully a welcoming focal point and also something that will show reflect the creativity and spirit of the residents. And um, as a senior who's lived in Boulder County since 1972, I'm really hopeful that this development Bond Farm community will allow me to downsize into a condo and uh, still be an active artist and not have to maintain the studio that I've maintained for decades and be able to share space and tools with other people. And um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we, I really hope to fit with, into the neighborhood and the community. And I know Peter's making every effort on that front and that's encouraging to me too. So um, that's about it for tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Denman. Um, Susan, looks like 318 is our next number. Caller 318, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. 318, there you are. Hi, this is Hi. Charlie Watt. At 7915 Neva Road in Niwot. <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping you can hear me okay. We um, sure can. I'm a senior. Okay. I'm a senior citizen. I live alone in, in, in my own home. And I'm a fiber artist and a gardener and a retired rancher. And I moved to Niwot because my health was. Um, declining and I'm currently on oxygen 24 seven 
And um, so I, I found it impossible for me here in Niwot to continue to garden and raise food that I'm used to raising and do the things I'm used to doing for 70 some odd years. So um, I sort of looked long and hard just trying to say, how can I enjoy um, quality of life and still have a good homegrown food and take care of my health? And so I started to look around and I, um, you know, serendipitously ran across Barn Farm and it, op you know, it sort of gave an, an option where I could age in place and do as much of the gardening as I could. And when I'm on oxygen 24 seven, then not. And um, I could still partake of the bounty. And for me, that's really important. And I have listened to, to all the comments of this meeting and I agree with, with some <laughs> on I wish the architecture was more like my ranch home, or I've always lived in really old vintage homes. But, you know, there's, I have to look at what, what is the most important thing to me now at this age. And since the COVID outbreak, I've been mostly housebound and I'm on oxygen. And um, also an oxygen home. So I'm at very high risk. And I feel Bond Farm would offer that community where I could be supported and not be so isolated. And many of us in the baby boom generation cannot afford to go to, you know, the um, assisted living and the things that that are offered now. And I think that this is an opportunity to offer something to that group, that population that need desperately to have some place where they can go and be a part of a community to have people who can care and share shopping and do those things. Um, that's, you know, that is there is no price you can put on that. And so, um, yeah, I just, I really want to stress that, you know, hopefully this, the COVID-19 will pass and the number of Amazon trucks and whatever won't be so grand. I mean, I sit here in my house and I watch, and I watch a number of trucks go by. I watch what's going on and it's, you know, it's devastating, but that's where we are right now. And I think we need options. So it's not the time to say, oh, I wish it didn't have this kind of this or that. I really think it's time that we say, what do we want to provide to our community? And I think this bond farm would be an excellent opportunity to provide something for seniors, young people, uh, people who are interested in the environment, people who are interested in good food. So I thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Watts. Appreciate it. Um, Susan, I think the next number is 332. Caller 332, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. 332, can you hear me? Hello? 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 Yes. This is Annie Brook, and I live in uh, 4425 Driftwood Place in Gun Barrel. So I'm actually in Boulder County. And the things I wanted to talk about today, and first off, I wanted to appreciate Longmont's focus on community. When I moved here to Gun Barrel, I was hoping I would be in a neighborhood where I could develop neighborhood friendships. And even though there's many people, and it's not, you know, it's not high density, it's single family homes. People don't really uh, make an effort to get out and to meet each other because their lives are all, everybody's got their own busy life. And one of the things I appreciate about the feeling of Longmont is you really 
working on development that creates community and sustains families and quality of life. So in the, you know, the current situation, I've seen huge condo structures popping up all over Boulder. I live on the outskirts without any concern for the rest of the neighborhood they're popping up into. And as I look at things, growth is happening and development is happening everywhere. My sister lives in Portland in the lovely old house neighborhood and the new laws to try to keep up with the need for housing allow any corner lot to build multi-unit, multi-level condominiums on the corner. So there's nothing, you know, I think what's remarkable and useful for the Bond Farm is that it is a cohesive total concept design. And that's very different than some developer buying the property and building 90 units to try to get as much revenue from as much density as possible. Now, uh, in terms of the concept design, and it's not just the buildings that have been uh, built into the concept design, but it's the sense of community. And one of my focuses has been on all of the community workshops that build a cohesive, integrated people connection, because there's no guarantee, no matter where one lives, whether that would actually happen. But we have had community workshops, which you actually have to attend in order to become a Bond Farm member. And we've had those on permaculture. We've had those on art projects. Uh, everybody's been very involved and requested to be part of the concept design. And my uh, good fortune was being able to help support the communication workshops. So I was able to bring in skill sets just because of the nature of my work that support people learning how to listen to each other, even if you have different opinions. And often that's where the rubber meets the road is, can you actually function and get through difficulties? And we've had two of those workshops with high attendance and the it was remarkable to see the change in view when people had the skill sets and the willingness to sit down and listen to each other. And we went through, you know, one of people's personal <laughs> emotional impact things is their favorite pets and their dogs. And we had everyone lobbying for how the pets would access the property. And after listening to the entire group, went back and changed our initial decision to include all the members' views and to make some restrictions on animal use. Now, that kind of thing doesn't happen if you don't develop a kind of concern and care for others. So I understand the Bond Farm is dropping into a neighborhood that, you know, it was nice to have four or five empty acres for years and years. And the truth is it's now in a transition zone development. And my hope is that the benefit of having a cohesive total concept design with a kind of mixed neighborhood is really uh, forward thinking. Forward thinking for Longmont, forward thinking for the neighborhood, and being able to develop a more sustainable sense of community that is mixed age and also really loaded with green space. And that's what I love because being, I am not someone who enjoys the condos sitting on a post, post stamp size acre, you know, lot where the house is almost bigger than the lot itself. And so I'm really uh, appreciative of the, the strong effort to listen to the local community and to develop a cohesive concept design. And I'm sure that the feedback offered by local neighbors is gonna be considered and worked with. So I wanna thank first off the commissioners for being able to listen to all of us and, you know, take this in and, uh, also for a city that is forward thinking and I know it was a lot of hard work and that the city really put out their, uh, you know, the support for Ms. Ms. Brooke, working I, with I, I, I do need to, I do so need to thank cut you. you off there. Um, That's all right. I've, okay. I've spoken enough. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Susan, uh, I think. 350 is next.
Susan? Caller, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> Caller 350, I am going to ask you to unmute. 350. Susan, that is me, Jean Jasmine. I've already spoken. Okay, thank you, Jean. Appreciate that. Uh huh. Caller 878, I'm going to ask you to unmute. 878. Are you there? Hello, can you hear me? We sure can. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, hi, my name is Irene Favor. I live at 2435 Lily Court in Longmont. Um, this is a brand new, just finished condominium for people over the age of 62. It's an age restricted community. Um, I moved here from my single family home in Old North Longmont, um, primarily because um, I was over 70 and maintaining that um, property was just getting to be pretty onerous. But since I've been here, I've only been here for a couple months now, but what I really value, I mean, it's great having no maintenance, but what I really value is this sort of sense of community um, that is developed among the residents. We have about uh, 50 uh, units in, our, in one giant building, I admit, that's pretty dense. So... Um, what I want to what I want to emphasize is that that sense of community that is really uh, great for me that I have found so valuable and that other residents here have found valuable is is really needs to be available to single family um, uh, to nuclear families as well young people especially when they're moving into a an area like Colorado where it's fast growing and um, they've left their extended family behind with all that sort of practical and emotional support that it, it provides. Um, so they, that's what's really nice about co-housing because it's really focused on community building. I think um, Annie Brooke talked about um, how important, how that's really central, that uh, learning to build community is really central to the whole idea of co-housing. So I, and I really understand that um, that people in the neighborhood would love to keep that um, five acre lot vacant, um, but it's zoned um, and it's going to be developed. Um, and I would hate to see, uh, I would hate to see a 90, the, the, the possible density that could be there. Um, I really like the green space of, uh, of the farm concept and uh, integrating the, I've been to, um, I've, I actually am signed up for Bond Farm. Um, and I, re I really like the idea of integrating the trees, the, the fruit trees and the berry bushes into the landscaping. And for the people who talked about losing the path, um, that might be a misunderstanding. Um, there is no, existing path that's going to be taken away. Uh, it was a proposed path that was originally going to be a, uh, a gravel path, a very kind of rural looking gravel path along one side. And then it morphed into this 10 foot wide concrete um, monstrosity that um, I wouldn't want running through my neighborhood. So um, I think the proposed path on the other side really is probably a better uh, solution. Um, I hate to see all the growth in a way, but it's coming to it's coming to Longmont. Um, it's coming this way, and I think it's kind of short-sighted if we don't recognize that um, and take and take advantage of what's possible instead of letting it sort of roll over us. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Favor. Um, Susan, I think we are back to numbers 519 and 073. Which you are correct. Before. I'm gonna unmute 519. 519, I'm going to ask you to unmute.
caller 519. Okay, let's let's uh, give them, let, let's, we'll, we'll just have to pass on them, I guess. Okay, caller 073, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Caller 073, do you hear me? Well, Caller yeah. 073. You should see an opportunity, a, a button pop up on your screen. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. So we're going to take okay. Caller 519, and then next will be 073. 519, please state your name and address for the record. You may begin. Yes, this is David Coddington. I live at 4140 17th Street in Boulder, and I am pro Bond Farm. Um, I have been a 39-year resident of Boulder County, and I've actually spent some years in Longmont as well, and I'm planning to live in Longmont again in the Bond Farm co-housing community. There have been many changes that um, several people have alluded to uh, tonight, and um, I just want to tell you, as the Design and Construction Committee Chair for Bond Farm, this particular HOA is very unique. I, I have, I'm also the owner of our roofing. And I've seen uh, many HOA construction projects, and Bond Farm is one of a kind. Um, the developer has been inviting us, and I would say requiring us, to bring our input um, and participate in a big way with this community. And um, it's rather unusual for, for people in an HOA to be so involved um, in this way. Um, I think this is a really good model for uh, for productive citizen, citizenry. And um, I just wanted to share a few thoughts with you. Um, we've had uh, several seminars. Uh, Annie Brooke touched on one of them. Um, she supported us in the decision-making process and uh, uh, her expertise in conflict resolution. We've also had um, seminars on permaculture, on site design, uh, finance and legal to name a few. and. Um, I was happy to lead a, um, a meeting of, uh, I should say, a, a vetting of our interior designers where the entire community was involved um, with uh, input and, and ideas and um, discussion with the potential interior designers. And then as a group, we voted and made a decision about our interior designer. This sort of thing doesn't usually happen with an HOA. Uh, we, we are very involved. Um, we are a very active community. It's sort of like a little city within a city. And so I, I think this is a very unique opportunity um, for us to participate in, in this, uh, this model and also to, to be an example for the rest of Longmont. And um, I'll just reiterate a few points that have been made already. I, I believe that the, the pathway um, that is being proposed to be moved on the east side of the property is a good solution. Um, I also feel that there, there's, there's this thing called budget considerations. I know there've been some, um, some comments about the, the architecture and the design and so forth. There, there are certain things that we have to consider as a group in the design. And, and if, we, um, if, we aren't careful, if we aren't careful, we're over budget. And then that puts us into the realm of possibly not being able to deliver on this project. And then as others alluded to, uh, potentially another developer comes in to maximize the property and have many, many more units than what we're proposing, which is really, um, it's, it's designed to be uh, considerate of the neighborhood and much more efficient and, and, and along the lines of permaculture values. So um, I'm just letting you know that I, I think this is a great opportunity for the neighborhood and unfortunately, it is inevitable that this land will be developed um, uh, for, for the neighbors that have been there many years. I know that these impacts are concerning and I appreciate your concerns. We really want to be good neighbors and we're doing our utmost to make this, um, this co-housing community uh, uh, as little impactful as possible on your neighborhood and, and actually um, be a benefit to the neighborhood. Um, 
that is what I have to share this evening. Thank you, Chairman Chernick and commissioners for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Coddington. Um, I believe, Susan, that that concludes all of our callers. You are correct. Okay. We will close the uh, public hearing of, of this and we will start our, our discussion amongst the commission. Who would like to kick it off? No, I have, uh, okay, Commissioner Haidt, please start. Why not? I always like to go first. Um, <laughs> overall, um, Mr. Spalding, I like your idea. I do have two questions for you though, and I have one for Ava as well. Um, but back to Mr. Spalding, um, there are a couple of standards that I've been beating myself up and some of uh, planning staff uh, over the last two days, um, trying to, to, to understand in my mind. Um, in particular, because you applied under an old code that references an old land use, uh, I'm sorry, a, an old um, <clears throat> comprehensive plan, which comprehensive plan got updated and now you're being reviewed under the old code, but the new comprehensive plan, um, those two have to jive together. Um, specifically under the old code, um, you are proposing a PUDR, which has to comply with um, PUDR standards, which may cross-reference to a neighborhood center. Um, a neighborhood center is a concept that's applied when there's both residential and commercial activities taking place in one PUDR. Um, <clears throat> so you're under the old code, but the new um, land use, I'm sorry, the, the new comprehensive plan, Envision Longmont. And Envision Longmont states that with respect to neighborhood centers um, that abut older and established less dense neighborhoods, um, the development of budding a lower intensity established residential neighborhood should provide a transition in massing and height. Um, and as I look at your plans, your building A, your massive structure, well, I, your, your big structure, um, right up front and personal, um, across the street from smaller bungalows on Spruce Street, to my understanding. Um, and I see that the rest of your plan has transitions really from the, the more dense, more intense building on Spruce back to less dense properties lower down the hill and away from Spruce. Um, so my query to you is, could you have flipped that? Could you have put your SFRs on top of the hill um, and had more density at the bottom of the hill? Did you look at that um, to, to try to provide this transition that you're statutorily required um, to try to meet. Yeah, our, our design team did look at that ex exhaustively in the beginning <clears throat> when we first proposed this project. The issue is, is that because of the grading, you know, there's a there's a 35 foot elevation change on the site and how you design the drives, it really has an impact on the overall design. And what we want to do, what Co Colorado Co-Housing Development Company wants to do is to create sort of a new type of housing model where we're introducing an economy to the HOA in order to reduce dues. So we really need to take advantage of the contiguous land component. And because of the grading on the site on the upper level and introducing houses there, that's really the steepest level. So a normal developer might choose to, you know, take advantage of the land and to pave the whole entire thing. But here with the opportunity of building a two-story structure, which um, there are many homes along the south side of Spruce that have two-story structures, we're not exceeding that and we've broken the building apart. So we're able to get the underground parking underneath those two stories. So that really eliminates, uh, we're taking advantage of the natural site. It really eliminates the need for spread out parking all over the place. Otherwise we wouldn't really be able to create a CSA and then make it even more challenging to actually develop the park to the east. So there are, there are a lot of considerations built into that. Um, and that's, you know, we believe in 
mixed housing types and a scale of economy. So instead of sticking everything into one building, we want to be able to have units that are 720 square foot units to 1800 square foot units in the condo building. And then our townhomes are in the 2000s and then our four single families are uh, 3,300 square foot. So with all of that makeup, um, it was a really big design challenge for us to get to where we were. And if you look south, go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I understand that you're trying to put in a, a mix. I'd lodge you for the mix that you've come up with. Um, can you tell me though, why the big building can't go at the bottom of the hill? Is there a simple answer to that? I, I know that you have design constraints, but tell me why you can't, why, why that can't flip? Well, I think you, it's it's really the design consideration of the grade and the and the how we're how we're trying to conserve the land. So we our goal is to to preserve as much land as possible and to have a minimal footprint. That was our intent coming into this whole entire design. And when we originally came to the city, that's what we came forth with. And to flip it around, we would actually be, we would actually, it's, I'm not saying that it couldn't be done, uh, but it would be, it, we wouldn't be able to create the co-housing that we're, we're creating for this community as it is. It'd be drastically different. Um, there would be very little land uh, to cultivate. Okay. And our, um, and our design team felt that this was the best solution. And along the way, we've, we've been supported through the planning department moving forward in this direction. You know, um, I also see that there's a standard that in a mixed use development um, in a PUD, so in the PUD setting, um, what we need to make sure of is that the commercial and the residential are both benefited. The employers are benefited by having residential nearby um, and the residents are benefited by having commercial nearby. Can you briefly say how your plan meets both of those goals? Well, in, during our first um, concept amendment or the annexation of agreement amendments when we pre presented the concept plan, we got a lot of resistance from the neighborhood on actually introducing commercials. So we've actually, and the, the planning commission in 2016-17 actually was requesting us to do more live work units so that they promote smaller uh, businesses. So we sort of incorporated the live work concept rather than the commercial concept. And I think that that level of integration in that area um, is appropriate for that neighborhood since it's right on the edge of industrial. So in this instance, the, the, the employer is the resident and that individual is benefited by being able to work and live in the same unit. That's correct. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Pereshevsky, I have a question for you regarding the timing um, concerns that I raised, um, which are that you know, this, this project has taken a long time to get to where it is. Um, and then my query was whether or not there are standards or limitations on how long a, you know, plans can sit um, or what type of activities have to take place before a a plan is deemed abandoned um, and you pointed me to the right direction that, you know, it's a 120 day threshold that's somewhat um, discretionary on the land use on the planning department's director. Um, and you shared with me a letter from February of 2019 where you had set a hard date of August 23rd, 2019 for the applicant to respond. Um, when I look through the report that is put together, it looks like after this February exchange that it, your report indicates that in May 2019, a response was forthcoming, even though you'd set an August deadline. But then your report also says that that second iteration had to have additional work done to it and that the applicant didn't respond for seven months. 
there's a 120 day or four month limitation before the planning director has the authority to deem the application um, abandoned. And in this instance, you indicate that there was a seventh month time period. My question is, was there a second letter indicating that, you know, they were running late again? Um, was anybody looking at, you know, what happened between May 2019 and whenever this next response came? Your, your report says seven months, which would have been, I guess that's close to December 2019. I, I don't know what the dates were, um, but it looks again to have been another significant period of time where, you know, no response had come. Um, and if, if, why didn't the planning director look at that it, as an issue of possible abandonment? Uh, Chair Shernick, uh, Commissioner Height. So uh, what uh, Commissioner Height is referring to in our, in our zoning code, in, in particular, the one that we're reviewing this against, um, the, Reviewing development applications, it's um, very vaguely written, but it does say um, once an applicant turns in an application and receives feedback from city staff, they have 120 days to resubmit their project uh, or the planning manager director at their discretion could withdraw the application. It, the key word is uh, may do this, not shall do this. Um, because we try to be fair in the planning department, we typically I uh, will write a letter to the applicant and say, by the way, you haven't submitted in 120 days. Uh, you've got 14 days to get back to us, resubmit your project or withdraw. Um, and so there was an instance in which uh, Mr. Spalding uh, lost the initial architect and uh, needed additional time to bid for a new architect and then redraw the plans again. He submitted a request in writing and uh, we um, looked at that and then we sent him back a, a letter officially giving him the extension. Um, there was a second period of time, I believe, when Peter was working through the off-site easement agreements with the other property owners to try and make this trail happen and get utilities. Um, and he gave us something in writing and Commissioner Height, that was might have been in the form of an email. I was in a rush and of course we're all working remotely. I was looking through my file. It might be in the office. Nevertheless, um, we did work that through with Mr. Spalding, evaluated it, and determined that he was making a good faith effort at trying to keep the project moving forward by working with the other property owners to try and negotiate easements. Uh, therefore, we gave him an extension of time to uh, get his plans uh, resubmitted into us. So that I did understand. There was indeed a second letter or a second series of course, a second bit of correspondence wherein another request for an extension was requested and granted. Correct. That clarifies a lot. Thank you. No more further questions. Okay. Commissioner Flagg. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. One of them relates to relating of the development across the street to the existing development. And I noticed that you've chosen architecture that does not at all reflect what is in existence in the neighborhood. And so that has always concerned me that if you're trying to blend in and be part of the neighborhood, why you wouldn't have uh, found architecture that was more like uh, what is across the street. And the other question I have is in regards to lighting. Could you describe for me what your lighting is? Um, the copy that I've had to look at, the uh, lighting isn't clear about full cutoff fixtures. And I guess I'm adjusting that to the developer himself. Sure, um, Alex, do you wanna chime in on this? Yes, I'll just say a little bit about it. Um, the full cutoff lighting, I think, is a standard that's been adopted by not only Longmont, but almost every community for full cutoff lighting. Um, I, I don't know if that, it, I'm pretty sure that will be implemented um, and is pretty standard among all developments. As for the architecture, um, there's a couple ways to kind of approach thinking about this. One of the first ways to think about this is what is co-housing community and what is Bond Farm trying to do? And it is something different than a single family house. 
So to significant to signify to signify that we use a different style of architecture. If we were doing single family houses, we would probably try to blend in. Or have you seen in Prospect, um, which is a great neighborhood in Longmont, contrasting styles do work in a neighborhood and they do add life in a neighborhood. Obviously, um, not everyone is gonna like the style of architecture that's there. There could be a different style of architecture and I'm sure other people wouldn't like that too. Um, but one of the things that we tried to think about was substance and substance has to do with scale and massing and form. And to give some context to this, the properties to the north on Spruce um, have about a 35 foot height limitation that they can have. But if you actually look at that street, right when you get off of the sidewalk, there's a four foot retaining wall going you know, vertical and then it slopes up. So that slope that on farm is on continues to go up. So all of those houses are actually at a higher scale than where we're starting at. The majority of the building is at 22 feet. So the majority of the houses on the north side are actually on basically the second level. And then we'd have about a 30 foot street. And then we actually widen the street nine more feet to put the parking off to the side so that it wouldn't be squeezed and people wouldn't be having some of these issues. So the road is actually getting bigger and parking is moving off the street rather than continuing to be on it. And then what you didn't see in the pictures because these were old renderings is because that parking is now parallel instead of perpendicular, we now have 20 foot of a greenway that has 15 trees in there. So I know you can't hide all architecture with trees if you don't like it, but there are more trees than what you're seeing in the renderings. Um, there's about 15 of those. And then once we get to the architecture, there's a couple things we did with it to address the mass and the scale. First, horizontally, we broke up the building so that there was no kind of, there's no section that's longer than 40 foot. And there's no section that's longer than 40 foot that doesn't have a vertical break too. So not only are there horizontal push pulls, but there's also vertical push pulls that bring down the scale. Um, and I think that lends it to this neighborhood uh, a little bit more. The also thing that's kind of deceiving is when you look at the plan and you look at that building, the plan looks like it's one huge building, but it's actually two buildings that are broken up. And it's even hard to tell that in renderings um, also, but there will be this nice access way to this beautiful park and gardens that are gonna be in the back and there'll even be uh, uh, vegetation throughout the whole building. So um, to, to kind of just sum all that up, there was careful, careful consideration to the mass the scale, the sizing, and to the reason for the architecture. Um, and I do believe that while it doesn't fit in with someone would want something like what they already have, it is proven that contrasting styles can work extremely well. And our background of prospect neighborhood is a shining example of that. I'd also like to um, add one more point. We are not designing these buildings with timber. One of the major uh, uh, issues in the 2000s and through 2010 were the construction defect laws. So we're actually building with ICF construction, which is insulated concrete forms. This allows for a very large or high STC rating, which is the sound attenuation. So our product that we're bringing is not only going to be a very sturdy product, but for the residents, it's gonna be a very uh, soundproof product for each of the units. So typically in timber, like the houses across the street, you might be looking at a 40 STC rating, which is really low and you get lots of audibles coming through your walls, like cars going by or an ice cream truck or kids yelling you know, in the street. With our products, we're starting off at an, a 50, 52 to 55 STC rating. So there's gonna be very little sound attenuation coming through the building and between the units themselves. And that also goes for the townhomes and for the single families. It's also great for the passive built solar design that we're incorporating into the site. So no, none of the structures, solar shadow impacts another uh, structure, which is another reason why we put the building on the north side. So sound attenuation for the community is a very high priority, like David Coddington mentioned, 
in our workshops, we invited with the architect all of our buyers to have input on the site design. And we all agreed that we wanted to move forward with ICF construction. And when you build with that kind of technology, there's certain types of, uh, you, you can't really do ICF with really dynamic sort of uh, building structures. And with what we've done, uh, we've put in a tremendous amount of work pushing and pulling on the building and separating it into, um, in order to maintain this ICF construction type. To no, it, it, um, can you speak directly into your mic? Because whenever you turn your head, you we we lose your your sound. I'll do my best. Okay. Uh, regarding uh, accessibility to your site, do you have full accessibility to all your parts of your site? And then, as that relates to, I'm not clear what the trail is doing. Do you have a trail through the site? Do you have a trail adjacent to the site? How does that work to get down to the open space that the neighborhood has customarily been able to do? Uh, so I think some of the neighbors are confused because I have opened up. I So people with dogs that walk along Spruce Avenue, I, I actually mow about two acres of our field so that they can walk their dogs on our field. So people who are on the north side of Spruce or people who see people work, walking on our property, that's just on our property. There's no, ac there's no current access to uh, Isaac Walton Park or to the same frame Greenway on the west side. There isn't, that's, that doesn't exist. So, so what happens then after you do a complete build out Yep. And people so, want to access that. So the way that will happen is when the city builds its park and the sidewalk is incorporated, the little Bond Farm neighborhood uh, park, which is on the corner of Spruce and Grant, it consists of a crushed gravel pathway. So the city has asked us to go ahead and put a five foot wide concrete uh, walkway that will connect to Grant. And then people will walk down Grant across First Avenue as one of the access points. So it's a, it's a much better solution because it's an ADA solution that's incorporated. Whereas if we were to build an ADA uh, pathway on the west side that's north and south, because of the elevation change, it wouldn't be ADA compatible. And if it's concrete in the wintertime, it just wouldn't be accessible because it ice over. Um, and another reason for that is if, if the, with the existing utility access, so there's a power line on the west side that's in Boulder County, and it also has communication lines. If we were to incorporate a trail there, they're asking for a 10 foot wide trail that would be concrete. And that's where we started running into issues with the homeowners in the Boulder County uh, portion who just wouldn't buy into that. Because when we first came to the table back in 2000, 2016 and 17, we were looking at a crushed gravel, five foot wide, quaint type of uh, pathway. And the neighbors at the time sort of bought into that. But when I presented uh, what would have been uh, code, or requested by the planning department, um, it was a, it was, it was a, they just rejected it outright. There was no way to get around it. So what I did was I invited the Hildebrands who own the property um, on First Avenue, which uh, the new utilities that we have to build for stormwater sewer. We brought them to uh, to the planning department, and we met with Public Works and. With the homeowner there, we worked on a solution that would be viable for them to give us the um, requested easement that we're going to need. And so it's a it's they they don't want that kind of foot traffic or that kind of uh, uh, structure installed on their site. So we worked for something that was still compatible for the city of Longmont, and, but still addressed their needs as well. So that was the decision was for us to continue the park on the north side to go only, you know, maybe 50 feet 
across the Bond Farm neighborhood to Grant Street and then go down south to make that connection. Otherwise, there are three other connections that are available for pedestrians where they can go straight down Spruce and hit uh, Sunset or they can go down Judson or Vivian. And there's a little section that you can cut across onto the existing trail uh, that will cut into uh, or land onto Sunset and uh, you just walk over the bridge into Isaac Wolfen Park. Thank you. Hey, Peter, uh, Steve Ransweiler, project manager for Public Works and Natural Resources. I'm gonna help you out a little here, a little bit here. We would prefer to have the public walk down the west side of Grant Street, if we could, rather than having a separate sidewalk down uh, the west side of the property uh, that Peter's trying to develop. Um, it's less maintenance for the city and it does not, it, it meets ADA accessibility and it's not a, um, just a du duplicitous um, piece of uh, sidewalk that we need to maintain. So we, we're in support of this. Um, I have a, I have a few questions. Um, so uh, Mr. Gore, um, I think you, you answered one of these, but I just want to clarify. So you said that, that the parking along Spruce, the 18 spaces along Spruce is actually going to be spaces that are on your property, not on city street. Is that correct? Not, sorry. And, and Sharon, the civil can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just a simple country architect. Um, but they're not on, the, on our property, but they're not on the street. Sharon, you have to unmute yourself. Hi guys, can you hear me? Um, so yes, the parking is connected to Spruce, but there's uh, where the property line is in terms of, is it, we have kept it within right of way. So the parking, based on its location, I need to pull up the plans to really jog my memory, but I think based on, I, I see some of the planning staff nodding their head. When we revised that, it was partially because of some right-of-way boundaries with the way the parallel parking was gonna be partially on the property, partially within right-of-way. So we, we moved to the parallel parking, which was more, provides more green space and provides better access to those spaces. So essentially we plan for on-street parking by moving it rather than just keeping the road the same width and people parking there anyways. And now you have these one-way stops and people can't get around. Okay, so uh, this leads me to something that I, I noticed on, on your photometric plan, which is page 55 out of your 57-page uh, drawing set. It looked like some of your photometric levels were not zero on those parking spaces. And, I'm, and we might have to go to one of the city staff to see if that's, I know I had to look really closely at that to read those numbers. Um, but I'm just curious, it, is that allowable um, because of the parking being in the right? I mean, usually we need a zero cutoff at the property line. And those numbers appeared to be non-zero numbers beyond the property line. Uh, Chair Shernick, sorry, I'm uh, going through the old lighting code quickly as we speak. Oh, that's right. We're working on the old code. Yes. Um, yeah. So there is, yes, there is no light trespass allowed in certain parts. Um, if you'll just bear with me, I'm, I'm looking through the lighting code quickly to find the section. Um, and while she's finding that, my recollection is that is actually street lighting for the purpose of that. Um, and because there's, I think, four street lamp lights for, for that reason. Um, but we can also double check with the engineer. So the code says, right. sorry, Alex. Uh, so the code says the amount of nuisance glare, i.e. light trespass projected on to a residential use from another property shall not exceed 0 0.1 foot candles of the property line. So um, I think when I plan checked it, it, it may have been just at 0 0.1. Uh, 
Uh, nevertheless, um, if it's not, uh, you can add a condition. If I miss that, uh, this would, if if it were approved and council approves the the count the concept plan amendments, um, this would come in for final PUD, and then we would do uh, the real tight, detailed uh, plan review in which we'd really call through the lighting plans and the landscape plans uh, for the detail. Okay. Um, Mr. Gore, another, another question. It's actually uh, page 25 of your drawing set. Um, can you explain how the parking works in the underground garage? It looks as though the spaces are stacked, if I'm reading it right. Yes, correct. Um, you are reading that right. They're tandem parking spots, um, just like you'd have a tandem garage. Um, obviously, it's more common probably in Europe than here, but in this co-housing community, it's uh, something that is more common than in the general public. Um, and then a lot of times, too, those parking spots relate to a single unit owner. Um, so kind of like my wife boxing me in at my house, um, it's I end up moving the car anyways, but it, at least it's single family. And, and Peter can elaborate too if, um, further if he'd like. Well, I, I, uh, before, um, let me just kind of expand my question a little bit. Uh, Mr. Gore just, just referred to um, somebody getting boxed in. Uh, and yes, they're all within one, one household. But um, Mr. Spalding, you, you mentioned during your presentation that, that, that you expect that, that uh, um, traffic issues will be reduced because uh, your uh, residents will, will not be using as many cars, et cetera. But with um, tandem parking like this, would that actually potentially cause an opposite effect of if, if I come home and I see that my, my spouse's car is blocking the space that uh, you know, is further in, in that tandem stack. Um, and I have to get out and move that car to put my car in. Maybe I'm just more prone to just, ah, heck, I'll just go park on the street. I only have to be here for 20 minutes. Um, so do, do you see my point that, that, that perhaps the tandem parking actually encourages people not to park in the parking garage? It's, it seems counterintuitive, but um, we had a couple, you know, of course, Bond Farm has had some attrition as far as buyers and sellers coming and going. And there's a, a, a condominium on 17th um, and Collier over in that area. And the Wassells, who were members, they had tandem parking. And he simply described it at first as, well, you know, at first we thought it was strange, but as a couple, we were able to work it out. Um, and it, and it's, it's really not a big deal at all. And whenever I have buyers who are interested in Bond Farm and I, I give them a presentation, I always acknowledge to them that if they're interested in a certain unit that this is tandem parking. And I haven't had any issues with uh, any of my buyers, um, you know, saying, well, I'm going to, park on the street level, um, that would be, we, they know that those spaces that are provided for them are theirs and that they can't take up other spaces within the community because they're assigned. And the way you plat out an HOA, you have common elements and limited con common elements. So we would actually be assigning those spaces to those homeowners and those are the spaces that they would have to use. Okay. And one more point to that. Um, tandem parking is a problem mainly when you're leaving. When you're coming in and you come in or your partner comes in, they will pull to the back or else an argument will happen. So coming in, you wouldn't have that where they pull to the front first just to, I mean, unless you're in a fight and you did something wrong, um, but that'll probably be rare. Okay. Um, while, while we're talking about parking, um, with the, with the city park being on the eastern edge of, of this property, um, and then you've got the 18 spaces going parallel across Spruce, what is your estimate as to how visitors to that public park, once it's, it's built, will use the parking and what that public park will generate in terms of traffic? 
I think that we have to look at this as an intent. Um, I think that the park is a, is a 0.85 acre park. And by the time you get done doing all the auxiliary, auxiliary sort of infrastructural things that you do for a park, and from my understanding, if Steve wants to speak to this a little bit, um, they're not so interested in um, adding a, a, a whole bunch of amenities to the park. So I think it's going to be more of a park that is for the residents. And um, Brian Horn had uh, done a pedestrian study at my request because I knew that this would become an issue. And with the amount of people that, I mean, I currently offer our property as a park to the community, as I mentioned before. So I know that there are about a dozen families that bring their dogs to our site and they walk around uh, all the areas that are mowed. So I don't see, I don't see it as a high use as far as traffic and coming. Maybe there's a barbecue or a gathering or something of that nature. I would imagine maybe three or four spaces might get uh, taken up, but currently there's you know, there's no one who, who drives uh, who drives here to um, walk their dog on my property or anything of that nature. So um, I think I'd leave it to Steve uh, Rainsweiler to, if he wants to comment on that, to give you further comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Spaulding. Um, Mr. Rainsweiler, any, any comment on that at all? Yeah, um, I agree with Peter that this is gonna be a small sort of pocket park it's going to fill a gap that we have in this area of town between Thompson, Roosevelt, Isaac Walton, um, and Sunset Parks, where there's folks in this neighborhood who don't have a park, park within a half mile of walking distance. That's, that's all, always our goal. And so that's what we're going to be looking to provide for uh, the residents of this area and for the city there's always the possibility that we'll, people will be coming from outside the neighborhood to um, to be, you know, coming to use this park, but I don't anticipate that being a large traffic generation, generator um, as after we develop this park. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, this might be a question for Mr. Gore now. Um, with the landscape buffer uh, request, which, which you have as part of this proposal, um, I believe it's building E, uh, the, the single family house that encroaches by like 28 square feet. Um, why not just change the size of the house? What, what, what precluded you from meeting the requirement by pulling two walls in and, and changing the house? Yeah, so <clears throat> the house is at excuse me, is actually a mirror of two other houses. So just like the triplex is a mirror of other ones, and so is um, a bunch of the units in the, in the big building. So to shorten, to change that building, there's a domino effect. So just moving in one wall, four feet or five feet in a house is actually a, is, is a huge deal because you have to then rechange that whole room. And if you rechange that whole room, it changes the whole relationship with the room next to it. So then you have to do a completely different design. And that really messes not only with the efficiency of construction and then the prices that you can offer these nicer homes for a lower price, but then also it, it hurts with selling because now you're giving, now there's a house that's a little bit less for whatever this reason um, that, that when you think about the trade-offs where there is that extra 15 feet on the other side, it is Boulder County land. The purpose of the landscape buffer is being met. It's a small trade-off from the city's, from what we feel the city perspective, because we're feeding, we're, we're filling those needs. And it would actually be a larger than, than originally thought trade-off for us to make those uh, interior changes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh... Oh, this might actually be for you as well. Uh, Mr. Swanson in the public hearing um, talked about, his question was um, for the residents that abut the property, uh, is there any plan for a screen or a fence? And what's, do you know what side he was talking about? Because I thought he said the north. I, I don't know which side, but 
what, 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 let, let's just look at your property as a whole. What, what, what plans exist for any sort of fencing or screening? Right. <clears throat> so for the north side, I think I went through the road and the setbacks and the landscape buffer and all that. Um, for the other sides, I'm trying to bring it up. But Jameson, actually, who's on the field, is our landscape architect. I don't think there's an actual fence. I think the landscaping is used as a fence. Um, and then the park, the park is abutting most of the neighbors to the east side. So that will be a large area. And I believe that they probably already have fences. Um, there. there, also just to add, I believe we are showing a fence between the park and the property on the east side. Correct, correct. So there is a fence there. And if you, uh, I'm having, uh, one of my associates zoom out. Um, on the west side, there is a lot of landscape trees and buffers and also on the south side too. And I believe that those neighbors have fences down there. Peter um, lives yeah, there. I can, I, I, can, I can talk to this. Um, so I believe the person in question, it lives on the east side of the property and the park would actually be, um, the park extends to their property. So there'd be a fence along there. And then the, the gap where the, at the south side of the park to the south side of our boundary, the residences already have fences. Um, the, the two on the south side of our property, there are cul-de-sacs. Those cul-de-sacs, um, we actually have to berm up the land. So the berming of our land would actually be a fence for them. On the west side of our property, there's the whole entire, um, uh, the existing utility easement. Uh, so there's a 15 foot wide buffer between us and the neighbors. Um, in general, um, co-housing for us, you know, we're not really into fences. We're really into landscaping a lot more. Um, we want to take advantage of the land. Um, and we think that by providing all of the green space that we're providing that the landscape architecture that the people will be looking onto is going to be a lot nicer uh, than an actual fence. Um, it, it's a debatable uh, topic, but um, you know, if there was if if there was a property owner on the west who wanted to see a fence, we would certainly work with them to do that. We're not opposed to it, but we believe in sort of an open site. Uh, we don't really believe in fences. Um, we just don't think that they're necessary. But there's a lot of natural barriers that are in play um, that I think address those concerns. Okay. Um, I have a question that's, that's, sorry, I'm hogging all the questions, everybody, but um, uh, it's probably for Ava. Um, uh, the Ava, the, the applicant has said in their presentation that they, would be willing to formalize in their declarations what businesses would not be allowed in the live work uh, spaces. Um, when, when would that be done? Is that something that needs to be made a, a condition now? Um, what, what would be the proper process to ensure that that happens? Yeah, sure, sure, Nick. Um, it's at your discretion. Uh, if you'd like to add conditions that they put uh, restrictions on the type of businesses on the cover page of the PUD, but certainly at your discretion. Um, the, I, I kind of went through those allowable uses in the staff report, but these are live work units. So uh, we would expect things such as one, one person offices, right? A lawyer, a therapist, uh, you know, whatever type of office, consultant. Um, potentially uh, a yoga teacher, uh, something of that nature. Um, that's what we anticipate, uh, a neighborhood serving use. Uh, and so those are the, would be the kind of things we'd monitor and track uh, from a business license standpoint. But if there are certain uses that uh, you wanna absolutely make sure are prohibited, uh, you can certainly do that at your discretion. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, the rest of my questions focus on uh, all of the, uh, the traffic issues. Um, so if another commissioner wants to jump in with, you know, before we get into traffic, uh, Commissioner Poland. Thank you. Um, 
Just a couple questions here. Since we're still uh, looking at the land, uh, Peter, just a qu quick question. Is the is it more steep on the north side as then as it gets less steep as you move to the south? Is that true? That's true. And uh, I just want to address one more thing about that. Um, and this goes to um, Commissioner Height. One of the reasons why it took, uh, there was a long span in our uh, submittal process was because in our second response back to the city, the new code, uh, and this is the fire department related, our first responders, they, we went from a 10% to a 6%. So that really lifted the, the, the amount of infill that we now have to bring into the site, which is a significant amount in order to make that drive, we, once we found that out, we negotiated with the fire department, um, Captain Michael, and she agreed that we could do 8%. So whenever, whenever with that grade change, it actually elevates the land and certain parts of our site become actually more steep and harder to access. So that's one of the reasons why we had to delay is having to readjust all of our building footprints and height elevations. And that was a, a, a very enormous challenge. So right now we're working with an 8% grade for the, our private drive. And then it gets a little bit steeper in certain sections, which is the reason why we have all the buildings on the south of the drive sort of acting as a barrier to the land, which is, which is the reason why it exists. You can think of it as a big wall, retaining wall holding back the land so that we can have these walkout basements in the farm section. So it's steep in one section, then it, you know, it's, it's an 8% grade, and then it gets a little bit steeper in order to access the farm, and then the farm area is a little bit less sloped. Peter, I if, I could, if I could chime in, this is yeah. Sharon. So I'm, I work with JVA, we're the civil engineer. One of the other pieces about this site that's very important is we're providing detention and water quality for the entire development not within the farm, but separate from the farm. And based on the lay of the land, you want that detention and water quality to be at the downstream end of the site, which is the southwest corner. Um, so moving the buildings around or shifting where certain buildings are makes the location for that drainage and detention more challenging to be able to capture all the runoff. So this staggered approach that they've taken with the highest density at the north and then gradually tiering allows for better water quality and low impact development design in, in how we've laid it out. And that's one reason why we didn't move. That's one reason why the main condo building isn't on the south side of the, build, uh, the site as well. You mean the north side? Correct. We, we, we located the, north, the, the condo building on the north side because on the south side, yeah. you, you run into so, so many issues. Okay. And then um, during the presentation, it was mentioned that there wasn't going to be a farmer's market uh, because it's kind of like anti-CSA. I was just wondering if you could give a quick 30,000 viewpoint of really what a CSA, what that means. So a, a community shared. Uh, so uh, Olin Farms has a 10-acre uh, CSA farm where you put in an order um, you may pay $750 annually and you'll get a food share and you can go by and pick it up and they'll call you when to pick it up. For the community, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a business model for the community in order to reduce the cost of HOA due monthly dues, which is a significant problem, I think, across the nation. You know, and as we see the disparity levels between uh, the wealthy and the middle class, I think people are starting to search for um, more efficient housing types. So if we can build uh, business models into co-housing communities where they're actually generating revenue, whether it be through associate memberships um, or the residents themselves, that's what we're trying to do. So that, we so that we're actually making a successful uh, organic farm to table. And then the community members, as well as the associate members will be able to take advantage of those food shares. So we're looking to hire a farm intern or a woofer, and we have a space designed for that individual to live on site. And we have an office for them in our underground barn, 
with a root cellar and greenhouse. So that's sort of the game plan for uh, the Blonde Farm co-housing community. Does that answer your question? I, I guess so. so. Would people be able then to like call in um, orders for food to pick up instead of just going like a farmer's market? It would just be an associate membership. It wouldn't be open to the general public, right? So okay. if, you, if you wanted, if you were a neighbor in the neighborhood and you wanted to be an associate member to Bond Farm, maybe it'd be a 1500 annual due. You'd get, you'd be able to participate in uh, a food share. And then you'd also be able to participate. We're gonna have a commercial grade kitchen. So you could envision us uh, having a chef stay for the weekend and uh, we have cooking lessons or a cooking workshop and there might be some sort of wine pairing or taste pairing. Then the associate membership, the associate members will be able to participate in that. Maybe there's an art okay. function or a music function. So that's the intent. Okay, thanks. Other questions, Commissioner Height. Yeah, Mr. Spohn, you raised it. The underground barn, um, what is that? So the underground barn is uh, under the private drive and there's a piece that comes out of it and it's the wood shop, metal shop. And then we have a walk-in cooler root cellar uh, that uh, we're gonna use for the storage of all of our pro uh, produce. So I was looking um, vigorously to try to find the plants and specs for that thing in your plant set and it's not there. Is there a reason it isn't there? Uh, it, you should be able to see it in uh, towards the end. Uh, um, Al, can you look up what page that is on the PUD? Yes, um, so it is on the site plan. Um, we're getting the page as we speak. Um, I, I saw it on the, one of the site plans. It's in between Wait, building one? F and G. They, oh, I've seen where it's located between F and G. Um, I've just never seen oh. the, the plan for it, the building right. plan. And, and typically, what, what's actually um, different about site plan review, so we work in a bunch of different cities. Some cities will scold us for putting floor plans in there. They actually don't need to see or floor plans aren't required. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one reason I, I think we, you know, we put the housing in there just for this one. Um, but a lot of times floor plans in a site plan review uh, situation like this aren't required and we, we often get yelled at. <laughs> so that's why they're not in there. And, and I frankly will tell you, I actually don't know if um, Longmont requires that you present that or not. My query is though, it does go underneath that road? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not part of the maker spaces that are in buildings F and building G, correct? Yeah, it's so separate thing. it's not part of F and G, it's... Right, so G, building um, or building F, yeah. shares the foundation for the greenhouse. And that wall, again, this is sort of creating that large retaining wall that's sort of behind the design concept. Um, and so we've inserted the, uh, the, the wood shop and the uh, root cellar underneath the road. And then we have a portion there where there's a walk down stair and then it wraps around a little space that will provide a bathroom and an office for uh, the farmer. Sure. And Commissioner Height, um, look at page 10 of their drawing set um, and they have an indication of the barn below on the- uh, Yeah, I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of the barn below. I've just never seen the barn below. Yeah, and the only other on sheet seven, you can see a section cut through it and the stairs so you can see the road is above it, below the road um, is that is the barn, and then the stairs allowing you to go down to the farm. And, and if it's you look, on the lower drawing, not the upper drawing. Right, and then sheet five of 57, which is the rendering. Yeah. You can see the stairs in the office. It's right there where the underground barn is. But then it extends north underneath the roadway. That's correct. Okay. So Ava, my question to you is, does that need to be set forth on these plans? Do we need to look at that? Do we care about that? Or is it just something that comes in later? Uh, Commissioner Height, it's not required. And uh, 
Alex is correct. Uh, we typically uh, ask applicants to leave those level of detail for the building permit plan set after a project's approved. Very I well. Like to review a floor plan, just the site plan. Thanks. Commissioner Goldberg. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Thanks to the rest of the commission for uh, some great line of questioning that makes the job easier for the rest of us. Um, well, I think without further ado, I'd like to bring Tyler Stamey uh, into the discussion, who's waited patiently. Um, as we all know, we need to make sure that the uh, traffic isn't adversely impacting the neighbors, and there's been no shortage of concerns about the traffic impact uh, going as far back as 2017 when this was first brought to the table and as recently as today by a few members of the public, John Pillman, Megan Williams, Moana Crushwith, forgive me if I mispronounce any of those names. Uh, but Tyler, in the packet, it says here that our city um, traffic team, you and your team approved the uh, traffic study that was uh, submitted for this project. Uh, but everyone is convinced that, all the public is convinced that you're wrong, that the uh, impact to the neighborhood is going to be great. And um, there's no way that uh, we can only see 30 or 40 more um, routes in the morning and in the evening during the peak time. So I wonder if, for the sake of anyone who's still listening, um, if you could just walk us through how those studies are done is doing a study in one day acceptable? Do we, is it an issue if it's done in the summer versus uh, when the schools are open? Uh, maybe just school us all a little bit on traffic studies and why these numbers shake out to being lower than we expect. Sure, Chair sure, Shurnick, sure, Commissioner Goldberg. Um, as we look at these traffic studies prior to sending the applicant on their way and doing a study, uh, we, we meet with the applicant to make sure that we have sufficient scope to cover what needs to be covered in the traffic study. Um, you know, generally, per our code, we typically don't require traffic studies for developments that generate less than 500 trips a day. This is one with some of the history that we've seen on this property being in front of this commission before. We know traffic was an issue and a concern. Therefore, we did require additional look at the traffic on this one. Um, you know, that in terms of how we generate those trip numbers, when what we're looking at, we're following data published in Institute of Transportation Engineers. They have a, a manual where it's a, a library of data points that have been submitted. It's, it's an average. It's not, obviously it's not perfect, but it's, it has a pretty high confidence rate when we look at, particularly residential generally has a pretty good high um, regression. When you look at the rates, the, number of trips generated per unit or it's it's pretty pretty close it's probably the most studied trip generation that we have um and i think you know what we're seeing in this 378 trips a day is in line with what we'd expect for this level of development typically multifamily generates fewer trips per day than single family detached housing um I think there is adequate capacity, which is borne out in the capacity analysis provided in the traffic study. There's adequate capacity on the road and the intersections, both on a daily basis and in the peak hours. Um, I think that there are some changes that have been made since this was last before you. I think one of the concerns that I remember, I was, I was talking to you guys about this before when it came through. One of the concerns was that angled parking that was proposed prior, and I think that was noted as a concern. I think the applicant's done a good job of addressing that concern. Uh, we've also asked the applicant to provide a slow point on Spruce Avenue, which I think is a concern we heard from the residents. That's a comment staff has been consist consistent in asking, and I think I heard the applicant say tonight that they are going to do that. Um, did I miss any parts of your question or anything else you want to know about? No, I think that's a pretty good summary. Excuse me. Um, it sounds like uh, first your team evaluates that um, the right content is provided in the study uh, and the that traffic study met that burden. Um, you're utilizing formulas from manuals that are proven 
you have high confidence in those formulas. Uh, this isn't just something that the city of Longmont created. This is uh, these are manuals that are utilized across municipality to munici municipality. I would guess mm -hmm. uh, because there's an emphasis. The multi-family properties tend to create fewer trips. Uh, there's, there's adequate capacity in your experience. The, uh, the applicant has made some changes uh, to the to their project, removing angled parking, for example, that will help that traffic flow better. Uh, and they've applied the slow points or you know any mitigating factors that you've suggested or that would be required. Um, many of the applicants mentioned that it's impossible for two vehicles to use it to pass each other without one pulling over to the side and you know letting another one come through. Um, is that a concern? Is that taken into consideration in your study? What can you tell us about that? Sure, sure, Nick, Commissioner Goldberg. So one thing about that. <clears throat> so it looks like when I'm doing some measurements here on Google Earth, it looks like the cross section of the road is about 30 feet. So uh, yeah, that is going to be tight when you have parking on both sides of the street for sure. Um, one of the, the things that does, I think we also heard concerns about speed and we also heard we also heard several people say you have to stop and wait for someone to pass by. So um, with, with that congestion, with that parking, it also does mitigate some of that speeding. It doesn't really make it possible to speed if you have that condition. So um, probably not the preferred condition. If we were building this new, the, ro the road would be wider. Reality is this is a relatively built out area and I don't think widening is an option without um, I, the, the homes are pretty close to the, the street, so I really don't think winding is an option. Any other options in terms of adding bike lanes or providing additional travel lane widths would require some removal of parking. Mr. Spalding? Okay, so maybe there's a little give and, give and take there. Sure. Um, yes. I, I guess my last question, I'm sorry, Chairman, did you, did you need? Oh, um, I think Mr. Spalding wanted to add on to Tyler's comment there. Yeah, okay. um, so a lot of the neighbors were describing the conditions that were at the end of Spruce and uh, uh, Sunset. So you don't really get that condition where you have to pull over if a car is passing by in front of our property because on the north side, the parallel parking is set into the row. So we're actually changing the curb. The curb actually comes in nine feet, goes, traverses across the north side, and then comes back up nine feet so that two cars would still be able to easily pass through, even if there's a car parked on the north side of Spruce parallel. Does that make sense? And, and this is along your front, and, and you're able to do that with the property that you have. You can do that. Um, right. To get away from your property, we're still stuck with the same. We have the same cross-section. Great. Okay, yeah, thank you for all of that. Um, I guess my last question, Tyler, before I open it up to the rest of the commission, is speak to the concern that I think John Pillman and Megan Williams raised about the study being done in the summer when kids are out of school, there's less uh, you know, parents taking their kids to and from school, school buses and, and that impact. Um, is that a factor when we're uh, reviewing a study? Do you have any perspective on how summer traffic flow differs from traffic flow when schools are in session? Sure, that's a, that's a valid comment. I think that the magnitude we're talking about here in terms of are we going to see capacity? Are we going to see the system break if we have some additional trips for school? Re reality is those additional trips are not going to break the system. Um, it is more likely that, yeah, they're, generally we see traffic volumes go up during school. Um, you know, we're kind of in a weird situation right now where I think a lot of the counts had to do with timing of when the applicant needed to, wanted to submit. They had older counts from a previous version, which were too old to use. We wouldn't accept the older counts from the previous time they did the traffic study. They had a submittal deadline that they were trying to meet. And any additional counts we do right now are sort of influenced. Everything's kind of weird right now with, with the pandemic going on. So, um, would it be better to count during school? Yes, school's not in session right now, so we really can't quantify that right now. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. A, a quick check back at the deck uh, at our uh, packet shows some feedback from the school district suggesting they estimate a total of 10 
uh, additional students to be generated from the project uh, and mentioned that the adjacent schools would be able to accommodate that. So maybe if the projection from St. Rain Valley School District is only 10 students, um, you know, I wonder if we can comfort the uh, public that's concerned about that difference between when the um, when the study was done by using the evidence provided by the school district that actually we're only looking at potentially 10, 10 or so um, added students. Maybe, maybe that will help. Uh, Brian Herman, looks like you had your hand up. Yeah, I, um, I appreciate um, uh, all that, Tyler. I would like to also add, um, <clears throat> you know, ideally we would take counts, but Tyler's correct. We were on a specific schedule. Um, the city asked us to do um, uh, ADT counts uh, along um, Spruce and Sunset as well, um, which the city has published uh, weekday um, uh, ADTs. So we were able to compare the ADTs that we counted with the, you know, kind of like normal uh, ADTs. Um, and we found that they were consistent along Spruce um, and that actually our uh, counts were a little higher on Sunset. So we, uh, which we would have done anyway, but we included a, a factor of growth uh, along Sunset to account for that distant, uh, difference. So we did compare the counts that we collected uh, against existing data, just to make sure it passed this, you know, uh, sniff test of whether or not the data was accurate. Okay, thanks, Mr. Hearn. Uh, Chairman, I'm good. Okay, um, Commissioner Onoran. I don't have questions, but I have a series of comments. I'm gonna just jump in. You know, we talked about the criteria of mutual support between commercial and residential. Uh, Commissioner Hyde brought that in. Uh, I'd like to add to that, that, you know, having smaller multiple businesses means you're gonna have a diverse set of services available in your community. And that's the best support, mutual support between residences and uh, commercial, which is happening in this particular community. Not only that, the likelihood that that's going to reduce the trips is going to be high. I want to add to that one more item. You know, some of the, one of the uh, commenters uh, mentioned that this community gives more reason for residents to stay more time in place. That means less trips out of the community. Every endeavor you're dealing in the community means you're avoiding one other errand, whatever that may be. If this was a dormitory place that is only housing, you go there to sleep. That means for every other endeavor in your life, you're going somewhere and driving. So that gives me confidence about the, you know, reduced traffic. Uh, we talked about, you know, the big building being up on the north. I was really surprised that, you know, Mr. Gore said this is contrasting. Well, actually, when you look at the massing, there are a lot of breaks in the massing. And the massing itself, not architectural style maybe, but massing fits and does everything to fit in to this particular community in terms of the intervals you see on the facades. So, yes, it's a big building, but it's not one of your, you know, 24 places you see everywhere is a big wall. You know, this is a very different kind of an attitude trying to really break and, and that break is not very artificial. It's because it's coming from what's behind the breaks. That is, you know, there are very different kind of units coming together and businesses coming together. So that creates an interesting diversity. Um, I relate to uh, Chairman Schoenig's worry about, you know, what if you don't use a tandem parking and go park on the street? But at the same time, these are covered parking. Why would you go park in the snow if you have a garage? You know, <laughs> garage is an act luxury. You know, it's like I wish I had a garage and put it in my car there. So that kind of thing. So uh, that kind of balances, and I'm not that worried. You know, it's an inconvenience maybe, but it's a preferred inconvenience. 
but I don't think anybody is going to park on the street and walk all the way down and leave that uh, space. The other part of it is that, you know, maybe there's a possibility of some of the tandem garages would be used for storage and such. And that happens everywhere. You know, it doesn't matter if it's tandem or not. If you have double car garage, people tend to put all the junk and then park on the street. But in the co-housing community, there's internal control. Neighbors control each other. If you junk up your place, somebody's gonna, you know, you're having dinner together, right? They're gonna say, hey, what you doing? So there's that. Uh, the interesting, we're talking about the narrow streets and such, you know, Boulder went through all sorts of arguments and adopted 30 feet curb to curb both side parking as local street standard. It's in the books now. The reason is that it's the best traffic control mechanism. You go slow, you don't speed. And then you don't need the speed bumps and all that stuff. You know, uh, Tyler mentioned that already. I don't want to go into too much detail of those. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I sympathize a lot of the worries of the neighbors. And our job is kind of tough. We need to balance that with the long-term interest of the community and what is best for community at large in the future. That's kind of the question we ask. And we have the comp plan to help us because comp plan asks the same question. What is the best thing for the community in the future? And but I usually read the comp plan and try to understand why do they say that? Well, there's a reason behind it. And in this particular case, you know, especially encouraging the diversity of businesses and diversity of lifestyles, that is the unit types. You know, we, we had this discussion in a couple of other projects, you know, people come in with 50 exactly the same plan duplex. This is the exact opposite of that. That is to say, as much as diversity you can have in a community this size. So that's why I really respect the concept and the proposal on hand. And I, what I would say to the neighbors, you know, I sincerely believe that at the end of the day, you're gonna benefit out of this the most. In the future, there's gonna be a time you're gonna say, good thing this thing came to my neighbor next door because I have all these benefits now. Yes, there are some worries that traffic, you know, nobody wants a whole bunch of people move next door. But in this particular case, maybe it's a good thing for you. That's my message to neighbors. And obviously, I'm supporting this project. And oh, one more thing, uh, the encroachment uh, uh, to the buffer. Uh, I don't buy Mr. Gore's argument that, oh, it would be so hard to change the building. It wouldn't be hard and building being a unique building is more value. But there's the other side of the argument. So what is encroaches? You know, is it against the intent of the buffer? When I look at the site plan, well, it's not a big deal. It's just a tiny little area. And then there's a lot of trees around it. So, so that's my attitude towards that as well, because, you know, I can, you know, say, you know, we're not here to torture people, right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's my conclusion and I support the project. Thanks. Um, just one thought about, about the encroachment into the buffer and, and Mr. Gore's explanation. Um, I look at that as, as uh, we're getting a lot of, of open space benefit, way more open space than, than what this project normally a lot, uh, requires. And um, he's also, he mentioned the efficiency of keeping that one building, that one house being a mirror of another house. And that should a little bit keep the, the price down. Um, so in our efforts to try to find more attainable housing and, and more affordable housing, anything we can do to keep the price down is probably a good thing in this day and age. 
So I would definitely support the uh, the modification on the on the landscape buffer. Um, any other comments or thoughts from other commissioners about this? Mr. Spalding, I saw you had your hand up. Were you wanting to respond to something? Yeah, I just, um, it, in, uh, thank you, Corke, for your comments and, and for yours as well. Um, it's, it, there aren't, so ICF construction is a relatively new model that's coming um, to the market and it's becoming, um, it's being popularized because it's such a good building product. Um, there aren't that many, just, this is just a bit of trivia. There aren't that many construction crews that specialize in ICF construction. And when you start altering the plans uh, for the ground crew that's on site, uh, to have to build all the scaffolding and to actually work with concrete in that sense, it does add a, a significant amount of uh, cost. And while this might not seem as much, it would sure uh, be a lot more expensive than it would be for a timber built structure. So I just wanted to put that in as a bit of trivia about ICF construction versus tip, uh, timber. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Height. Yeah, sensing that there's a motion coming, we'll throw in my last two cents. Um, I, I would also say to the community at large that the traffic, um, no seeming problematic um, from what we have heard and seen, it still meets standards, um, to which I would add, it could be worse. This is approximately, you know, a, a Two thirds of what could go in to this um, to this site is what's being proposed in terms of development units or dwelling units. Um, so it could the traffic could have been a, a bigger issue. Um, the encroachment issue. Um, I also feel that there have been mitigating um, design components that have been thrown into this project that that uh, mitigate that encroachment issue. Um, the problem I had with the neighborhood center requiring a transition um, from an established neighborhood to a more um, dense um, design. Um, I still have a problem with the fact that, you know, on the north side is where this, the, 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 the bigger mass of building is being presented. Um, though I will note that the standard um, is laudatory and not mandatory. The, the, the words are should um, and what Mr. Spartan explained that the, from a design and architectural standpoint, um, dropping the massive building down lower just didn't work. Um, I think convinces me that you know, they should, he can't meet. So I too am gonna to be voting in favor of this project. Thanks. Um, Commissioner Pollan, then Commissioner Flagg, then Commissioner Goldberg. Okay, I found my mute button. Um, <clears throat> I guess as, as we're starting to build towards this, there are a couple of um, conditions that have been, well, one's been mentioned and um, in going through things, I'm wondering if we need to add one, uh, another one. Um, so I'm wondering, it says that they are still working, uh, looking for the legal paperwork for the path. And I'm wondering if we need to put that as a condition. They said that they are working with, I think it's the Hildebrands and that there's legal paperwork going on, but it hasn't been acquired yet. Peter? Uh, that's correct. So we've been in negotiation uh, with the Hildebrand family with Mark Von Wagner, who is also impacted. And then there's another property directly to on the very Southwest corner. Um, all, I've worked with them all and they're all in support of the new design that we have, but we can't do the legal paperwork until we have the site plan review. Your, basically your and the city council's approval that this is the direction that we're gonna go for so that we can actually draft that paperwork. So I believe that for final PUD approval in the entitlement process when we do the site work and the actual construction of the buildings, that there will be language somewhere by the, the city attorney that states that uh, you're not gonna get a final CEO, a CEO certificate of occupancy until you have uh, 
uh, worked out these agreements with your neighbors on those easements. And that we would have to have that done uh, prior before doing our site infrastructure work uh, because uh, the new utilities that we're bringing in are stormwater and sewer. So that is at the very top of our agenda, but we need, we need to know that what we're giving to them as legal documents with the design work, which would be part of those legal design work um, and the negotiation of what the value is that they're giving to us for that new infrastructure that needs to happen after uh, city council approval and, and, and uh, this in the commission. Okay, Ava, are you still there, Ava? I'm here. Uh, can you clarify what he, what uh, Peter just said about whether or not it would be necessary for us to add language for, to get the uh, uh, to make a condition on the uh, legal paperwork for the path? Um, do you agree with Peter that at this time that's not necessary? I don't think it's necessary because the uh, compre um, concept plan amendment before you is saying that they're not providing the pedestrian path on their site and through other properties. What they're requesting in their PUD plan is that uh, residents use the public streets that exist currently, uh, either going down uh, Sunset Street or uh, one of the streets toward the the east uh, to get down and then across uh, to Isaac Walton Park in the Greenway. So I don't know that it's relevant uh, to condition. Uh, I'm not really certain about what legal paperwork um, Peter's working on or if this relates to utility easements, which is a completely separate matter from this trail connection. And that's something that would be required with their public improvement plans and their final PUD. Um, and Chris Huffer from Public Works is here to talk about any or answer any utility questions. Okay. And then I guess the other condition that's kind of been bantered around is if we want to put any kind of limitations on the businesses that would go there. It's been kind of bantered. I, I don't know if anybody has thoughts about that. So I'll throw that out to the commission. Um, given the fact that these are gonna be roughly 600 square foot of off, I'm gonna say commercial office space. Um, I'm not really worried about too much about anything big like a, a liquor store or anything going around. Um, I don't know if I'd even be worried about a dispensary because you know Longmont kind of monitors the number of dispensaries we have. Uh, but I'm wondering if anybody has any concerns and uh, would like to put any kind of condition on the type of businesses that would go in. Commissioner Honor. Regarding to that, I have a question for Peter. Uh, what's the control mechanism do you have within the uh, HOA, I mean, within the co-housing for the businesses? Do you have a control mechanism among your, neighbor, uh, among your members uh, for the type of business that can come in? Yeah, we're writing into our HOA declarations that the, there would be no payday loan. There, there are certain businesses that we've identified that will write into our HOA declarations that will not be uh, a part of our development. And the community, you know, through our various workshops, the community members all agree to that because we want businesses to come in that complement what it is that we're offering as amenities. So farm to table, artistry, you know, uh, uh, psychotherapy, massage therapy um, could be, you know, there's a couple buyers within the development, um, David Coddington, a roofer and myself that would like to uh, possibly uh, create an LLC so that we could purchase one of those units and put our offices in there. Um, so there are strategies like that that we're deploying within the community. Um, but as you know, the HRA declaration, uh, we don't formalize that until 75% of the community has moved into their units where they finally sign off on everything. So during the construction process, we'll even get more uh, into detail about what that HOA uh, declaration looks like, and then we'll submit that and get it recorded with the city. Commissioner Flagg, so sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Um, my question was in regard similarly to the uses, but my question was really, um, can there be changes to the spaces that you're allocating for live work? Can two of them join together to be made into a larger space? And the other part of the question was, um, since we don't have a floor plan of that underground barn, um, you have, I think I recall wood shop and roofing or something in there. I don't know what the square footage of that area is allotted. Um, and so my question is that, is it possible to expand that? And I don't know, maybe Ava has a, a bearing on what can be licensed to go in to the barn area as far as roofing or um, woodworking kinds of a business? Uh, the, the, did you want me to address that? Anyone who you've got an answer to. Sure. So um, the underground barn is, I believe, uh, they're going to be uh, about 800 square foot total. So the root cellar and walk-in cooler is one section. Um, and then the other section would be the, the wood shop. So they're about 20 by 20 spaces. Um, 1,200 square feet. Correct. I'm sorry? 1,200 square feet for the barn. Thank you. And then for, to, to address your question regarding the live work units, whether they could be combined, um, those units are probably gonna sell in the $400,000 range. And we're really interested in keeping them as uh, single units. The idea of combining them um, and getting uh, close to 2,000 square feet would be, uh, you'd, you'd be looking at a million dollars probably by the time you got done doing the architecture. But we are, uh, we, in the PUD plan, it states that we have uh, 46 units and combining two of those would reduce it to 45. And I don't believe that that, that would work out okay. with the city. Commissioner Goldberg. <clears throat> Thanks, Chairman. Uh, quick before my earbuds die on me here. Um, you know, I guess, uh, I think first addressing Commissioner Poland's question about do we feel inclined to list um, what sort of businesses should be permitted or restricted from the neighborhood. Uh, I'm not inclined to take on that endeavor. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure I feel like that's our job to do. Uh, I'm not harboring any concern about it. Uh, and um, I think if we kind of let it ride, that will take care of itself. Uh, but with that said, uh, I guess I'm inclined to uh, put forward a motion. I'm, I'm looking to see any hands jump up, you know, concerned about that. Uh, but I'll just throw it out there um, for the following reasons. One, because um, in our packet, the city staff identified how um, the applicant met the review criteria. I won't list them out, but our packet um, identifies how each criteria has been met. Uh, additionally, I always look favorably upon applicants who respond to feedback from the community, who engage with the community, who solicit feedback, and then and then uh, make changes as a result. So I appreciate that from uh, Mr. Spalding and the rest of his team. Uh, but additionally, beyond that, uh, we did have our fair share of concerns raised by the public, but there was also a lot of positive feedback from the public that really resonated with me. Um, I can list just a couple of them. Uh, Jean Jasmine mentioned agriculture, animals, and art. You know, what a, what a neat um, way to summarize uh, her perspective on this community and and I'm inclined to do anything that I tend to help enable that to come to our to this town that we love so much um, uh, forgive me uh, Nettie Pinman mentioned wanting to be surrounded by fellow artists a community of artists and, and that resonates with me um, Shirley what Shirley Watt again forgive me for any mispronunciation says uh, that she likes the idea of aging in place with a garden and the support of her community. Uh, and she sees that um, in Longmont more so than our neighboring communities. 
and if we can nurture that and enable that here, you know, in this format, then I'm inclined to do so. Uh, Annie said, mentioned a sense of community, but also mentioned that um, this is forward thinking. And, and I, I, I'm aligned with that. We, we have plenty of, you know, traditional projects popping up all around uh, and we're inclined to approve those as well. But there's something special about this application. And, and so um, maybe I'll finish with that. And so given with that reasoning, I'm inclined to recommend, uh, excuse me, while I read PZR 2020-5B, uh, and maybe I should just read it to get it right. Um, conditionally approve the Bond Farm Co-Housing Community Preliminary PUD contingent on City Council approval of the concept plan amendments to remove that pedestrian trail and recommend approval of the Bond Farm annexation and rezoning plan um, amendment application to City Council finding that the review criteria have been met by 2020-5B. Thank you, Commissioner Goldberg. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve 2020-5B. Um, I would like to ask you if you would be willing to slightly amend it for a condition that I would like to see, which is um, to add a condition that the applicant will work with city staff to ensure that the photometric plan meets code standards. Because looking closely at the drawing, I'm not convinced that it does, but I'm also confused as to exactly what needs to be done to meet the standard. So just in a caution of abundance to make sure the photometric plan meets the standard. Are you okay with adding that to the, to your motion? Uh, sure, Chairman. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so I think taking the motion that I mumbled out a moment ago and adding in that the applicant worked with the staff uh, to ensure that the project meets the photometric standard. Yep. If that meets if that meets the burden, then I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Then I'll go ahead and second your motion. Um, do we have any further discussion? Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Poland, I mean. Sure, thank you. Um, I just wanna say that I am in favor for this. Um, I do find that this meets 1502040 items A through E and 1502050.F.4 items A through C. Um, it does seem like the biggest issue um, there were two that were mentioned multiple times. One is the traffic. Uh, we went through that. Um, I am pretty confident that uh, in the whole scheme of things that this isn't going to add uh, a exorbitant amount of traffic to the area. I think that uh, the majority of these people are probably going to be the type of people who don't make many trips. Um, so uh, I don't believe that the traffic is going to be a huge concern for the surrounding area. Uh, the other one uh, that was mentioned a couple of times was architecture. Um, I do agree, I believe it was Alex who said that you could come up with several different designs and whatever design you're gonna come up with, at some point, somebody is going to have a problem with it. I'm not gonna to try to micromanage the designs um, I think it's a good design. I think when I look at it as a whole project, uh, as it goes from Spruce on down to the south and it goes into the farm area that they have, I think it's a well-defined uh, well uh, plan. Um, I don't see any big problems with it. Uh, could you get a little picky about things? Maybe, but that's not what we're here for. I think overall, it's a good plan. The architecture seems solid. so. I'm in favor for this, and I just want to kind of get that out. <laughs> All right, great. Um, I'll add my two cents, which is uh, I uh, will echo Commissioner Oneron and Goldberg and, and Poland's comments, um, but I'll summarize it with, um, I think Ms. Brooke, uh, her statement that this is a cohesive total concept design, that is what PUDs are supposed to be. PUDs are supposed to be something that is better uh, overall than what we could get through the standard uh, development process. And I believe that this project meets that. Any further comments? Commissioner Goldberg. Yeah, one last one, thank you. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, there was 
one or two concerns uh, raised by the public uh, neighborhood feedback, I think, um, that identified concern that um, perhaps this commission had made up its mind before um, arriving today or, and, and citing an example of unsigned approval documents as being included in the packet as an example of how the decision was made before we logged in today. And I just want to make it uh, abundantly clear that the reference, I can only imagine the reference to the unsigned approval document has to do with the three resolutions that are provided in our packet. Uh, and there's a space at the bottom for a signature. And it's important to, for the anyone who's reading that those, because it is a little bit confusing, they all read approval of, approval of, approval of uh, version A, B, or C. But, um, but just a point of clarification, A is approval as is, uh, and, and that would give um, Chairman Chernak the opportunity to sign on that line. Um, option B would be approval, but with a condition like we did here this evening. And uh, Chairman Chernak will, can, will proceed to sign on that line if the vote passes. And then lastly, uh, option C is approval of a denial or approval of not approving the project uh, and a place for the chairman to sign there. So I just want to be abundantly clear that um, there's no, um, the decision hasn't been made before we gathered tonight. Uh, the, the documentation in the packet is confusing, but um, we come in here ready to make the decision based on the evidence set before us and the testimony before us. So uh, with that, I'll sign off. Thank you for that explanation, Commissioner Goldberg. Um, completely agree. So let's take a vote on our motion. All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? Um, okay, Jane, it is uh, unanimous and it looks like we lost Commissioner Teta, or he's here, but I don't see his, his video. Commissioner Teta, what is what is your vote? Yes. You, there's a there's a little arrow on the right hand side. Oh, yes, I yes, we'll I, I, I see him now. Yeah, he, just, he 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 went on to the second page. So is that a yes vote, Commissioner Teta? It is. Okay. And seeing as how it's unanimous, seven to zero, um, I won't call for no votes. Um, so that passes. Um, let me read this. Um, this item will now be forwarded to the Longmont City Council for action. If you are unfamiliar with council procedures and intend to appear before council, please contact the planning division for further information at 303-651-8330. Okay. Um, we still have another agenda item. Chairman, uh, yeah, and Chairman yes. Chernick, we are, I think, running up running against the magic hour. Exactly, uh, our bylaws uh, have a rule. Oh, let me uh, do this before mm. we get into our housekeeping. Um, Mr. Spaulding, Mr. Gore, um, Mr. Uh, Haran, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, Ms. Procopio, um, thank you for being here uh, and helping us uh, look at and analyze your project tonight. Um, Best wishes to you. Um, thank you for your help, Ava, uh, getting us through uh, the application and all of the details. We need to uh, do some housekeeping here. Um, we have a bylaw that says that that uh, we cannot go past 11 o'clock uh, in our meeting unless we have a motion to do so. Um, do I see a motion from any commissioner? Uh, commissioner Teta. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we continue and address uh, item number two. Okay, Commissioner Poland. I'll second that motion. Okay, motion to continue past 11 o'clock has been uh, lodged and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hands and say aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We will continue past 11 o'clock. It is 10.50 right now. I think we could all take a 10 minute break. We actually need to change up some of the staffing. Um, uh, somebody's gonna call city attorney Eugene May and uh, get him to attend our meeting. So we need a little time to do that.
Um, we'll see. You yes, in Chairman. Minutes. Thank you.
Susan, do we have everybody back who needs to be here? Let me stop sharing my screen. Looks like we're still missing a couple of people. Okay. And our break slide is still being displayed for the public, so it'll okay. take another couple of seconds before it leaves. Well, I was a lucky guy. It turns out that my wife made chocolate chip cookies from scratch during the first part of our meeting. So, <laughs> yay. <laughs> okay, I'm jealous. I was trying to figure out where my peanut butter was. Yeah. Am I the only person in his office, not at home? I'm tuning in from home. Hi, Tier Shernak. Commission, <laughs> Eugene May here, city attorney, here to advise the commission on the appeal. I believe Brian Schumacher and I are both in the office. Not alone. Not alone. <laughs> <laughs> so Susan, are, are, are we ready to go on the uh, TV land side? Yes, looks like we've caught up. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll reconvene. Item number seven on our agenda is a site plan waiver for 210 Lincoln Street Accessory Dwelling Unit Appeal of Decision, PZR 2020-6. Um, Associate Planner Zach Blazek is listed on the agenda, but I believe it's uh, Brian Schumacher who will be presenting. Before we get into that, uh, I want to disclose that, again, just like the previous item, um, I live in Old Town on, on the north side of, of Third Street, uh, on Grant. Um, but in our packet, there are two letters uh, that were submitted uh, by Rick and Cindy Hogue, two separate letters. They are neighbors of mine that live two doors north of me. Uh, so I do know the Hogues. Um, but um, I've not talked to them about this, this project uh, or uh, had any ex parte communications with them about this agenda item. And uh, I'll be basing my entire decision off of what we hear tonight and what was in our packet. Any other disclosures from any other commissioners? Commissioner Height. Yeah, I have a client who lives um, one block north of this property. Um, he and I have never spoken of this issue. He is not um, participating in any of the comments here. Um, my um, relationship to him has no bearing on my review and consideration of the merits of this matter. Great, thank you. Okay, um, you heard uh, City Attorney uh, May uh, say that he is uh, uh, advising the commission and that's because uh, this is an appeal. Uh, Brian can, or Zach can take us through the details of that, but we have uh, two of the city attorneys here. And this is, you might've noticed that our PZRs are a little bit different. Um, so we'll need explanation of those as well. Um, so we know exactly what the wording in those is. Um, but let's, uh, is it Brian who's presenting? Thank you, commissioners. Yeah, Brian Schumacher, city planning staff. Susan, can you hear me okay? I sure can. Let me know when you're ready. Yeah, would you mind bringing up the staff presentation for this item? Thanks, appreciate it. Good evening, commissioners. Brian Schumacher with city planning staff. So I'll be assisting with tonight's presentation and pitch heading for planning, planning manager Burchett. Uh, staff members here this evening, including, aside from myself, include Zach Blazik, who reviewed the site plan waiver, Dane Hermson with uh, Code Enforcement is also with us. We have Director Joni Marsh and Deputy City Attorney Teresa Tate, in addition to Mr. May, um, all available to respond to questions that you might have regarding this particular application. So Commissioner Chernak, as you mentioned, this hearing is not typical of most of the public hearings that the commission reviews. Occasionally though, there are administrative decisions and interpretations that are appealed to the Plan and Zoning Commission. Per the Land Development Code procedures, the applicant or the owner has the ability to appeal an administrative decision. And this is typically related to either a denial or specific conditions of approval that staff may place on an administrative decision. 
Susan, next slide, please. So similar to an appeal of the commission's decision to city council where city council acts as the appeal body, in this instance, the plan and zoning commission is the appeal body. This slide outlines the basic framework for the appeal hearing. So as I'm doing right now, presenting the staff appeal report, next the appellant of the applicant would present their information and then we'd open a public hearing if there's any members of the public who'd like to speak on this item. Then there'd be an opportunity for the commission to ask questions and have discussion. There would also be an opportunity for rebuttal by both the applicant and staff. And then at the end, then the commission would have an opportunity to make a motion and vote on this item. Um, as noted in the packet, there uh, is a letter from the applicant as well as comments from the public. And in addition to the public comments in the packet expressing both concerns and support for the proposal, uh, there were several other additional emails that were received that were forwarded to the commission this afternoon. Hopefully you all received those. Uh, there was three uh, emails from Kayla Spangler, Sandy McCarthy, and John Mackinnon, and all three expressed support for the applicant. And if you have questions about that, I can bring those up as well. So when the commission makes a decision on the appeal, that decision is not appealable to city council. Appeals of the commission's decision as an appeal body would be the Colorado Court of Competent Jurisdiction. Next slide, Susan. This slide outlines the commission's role in this appeal hearing to hold a public hearing on the appeal and to make a decision on the appeal to either uphold, reverse, or modify the administrative decision that was made on the site plan waiver. You probably noticed that the plan zoning commission resolutions are in a different format than for typical applications. And these were specifically drafted for this appeal hearing process. For the appeal, the burden of demonstrating that an application complies with the review criteria and the approval criteria is on the applicant. The city or other parties do not have that burden to show the criteria have not been met. Next slide, please. So this slide just is a vicinity map showing the general location, 210 Lincoln Street on the east side of Lincoln between 2nd Avenue on the south and Spruce Avenue to the north, not too far from the bond farm item that was just heard. So this property is zoned residential mixed neighborhood, RMN, and that zoning permits one ADU on any property with one primary single family residential dwelling unit. Next slide, please. Property, as I mentioned, is zoned residential mixed neighborhood, and the zoning was updated with the Land Development Code update in 2018 to be consistent with the Envision Longmont Land Use Plan that was adopted in 2016. The Envision Plan contemplates accessory dwellings as a secondary use. Next slide, please. So for background, this slide shows a proposed site layout with the primary residence facing Lincoln Street and the proposed accessory dwelling unit in the back of the property off the alley. And this, this site plan is included in your packet as well. As staff also wanted to convey some of the actions that occurred over the past year regarding this matter as noted in your staff report. So that included a combination of things. One that started in September of 2019 was code enforcement sent a notice of violation for an unpermitted accessory dwelling unit. Also at the same time, after the notice of violation was sent, staff met with the applicant to discuss options. And one possible option was to consider uh, an accessory dwelling unit on the property subject to that accessory dwelling unit meeting all the code standards or review criteria. And then in 2019, uh, sorry, December 2019, uh, the code violation at that time from the September code violation was corrected. The ADU components were removed from the accessory building. In February 2020, the site plan waiver application was accepted and initiated review. We went through several rounds of review on that. In May of 2020, there was a second code enforcement complaint that was made regarding occupation of the rear structure. And then in June of 2020, uh, staff denied the site plan waiver application and that was issued to the applicant. Next slide, please. So the site plan waiver application request was to permit a detached accessory dwelling unit and the existing accessory structure located to the rear of the property at 210 Lincoln Street. 
This slide notes the differences between some information that's provided on county records and the application that was submitted as part of the site plan waiver request. So not all portions of the property improvements have been constructed with required building permits and that's noted in your staff report as well. Next slide, please. The floor plan for the proposed, this slide shows the floor plan for the proposed accessory dwelling unit. And that's also included in your packet. The accessory dwelling unit was proposed to occupy a portion of the space within the rear accessory building that contains bathroom, kitchen, bedroom, typical of an accessory dwelling unit, comprising an area of approximately 511 square feet. The proposed floor plan shows two separate enclosed storage areas not to be included as part of the accessory dwelling unit area and closed off from the ADU living space. Next slide, please. So this slide generally describes, depicts the types of code standards applicable to this type of application, specifically related to accessory structures and accessory dwelling units, including the relationship to the principal structure, in this case, the principal dwelling. Next slide, please. So the code accessory use standards include restrictions on the size of in individual accessory structures, including accessory dwelling units, as well as the total area of all accessory structures. The items highlighted in yellow on this slide are areas staff found to be non-compliant with code standards. Both the size of one accessory structure, that being the rear uh, accessory dwelling unit, as well as the size of all combined accessory structures on the property. So I'm not going to walk through all the calculations as part of my presentation, but if the commission has more specific questions, Zach, who reviewed the site plan waiver in more detail, should be able to provide more details for the commission. Next slide, please. So in terms of the review criteria analysis regarding criterion one, there's a couple of areas that staff felt that it didn't meet this criterion. One is that the proposal does not comply with the current land use code requirements. And second, that structures on the property were illegally expanded or constructed that violate code, building codes. Next slide, please. Regarding criterion two, the application is not yet in full compliance with all applicable city standards, including drainage standards. Regarding criterion three, there are notable discrepancies between Boulder County property records and the application regarding the square footage of both the primary structure and the rear accessory structure in which the ADU is proposed. So there are no city planning or building permit records indicating that expansions for either structure to the floor area have been permitted. These discrepancies indicate that the structures were expanded without approvals and the expansion on each structure are illegal rather than non-conforming. So structures expansions without proper approvals creates incompatibility and potential unsafe land use and building layout and design. Staff did find that review criteria four was met. That's not included on these slides, it's in your packet and also review criteria five and six are not applicable to this particular application. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, the applicant has the burden to demonstrate that the application complies with the applicable review criteria. So next slide, please. This slide reiterates options available to the commission as noted in the resolutions included in the packet. Again, either to uphold reverse or modify the director's decision to deny the application as noted in resolution 6A, 6P, or 6C. Next slide, please. This slide outlines the reasons why the application was denied, including non-compliance with code standards related to accessory structures and accessory dwellings, and non-compliance with review criteria one, two, and three, as I noted before. As a result, the city requests that the commission uphold the decision of the director to deny the site plan waiver application for 210 Lincoln Street. Next slide, please. So that concludes my presentation. Although this slide asks for questions at this time, based on the procedural slide shown earlier, slide two, which we can go back to and reference as needed, the next step would be for the appellant slash applicant to present. I believe Alex Gore will be presenting for the applicant this evening. After the applicant's presentation, the commission would open the public hearing if there are any members of the public that would like to speak on this item. After the public hearing, the commission has an opportunity for questions and discussion. And before the commission entertains a motion, there's an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant and staff. 
So I just asked Teresa or other staff, is there anything else to note before we move to the applicant presentation? If not, I would just say thank you to the commission and we can kind of move on to the next step. I would note that it is a de novo review, which means that the commission applies the facts presented at the hearing to the criteria listed and makes an independent determination. All right, let's, uh, let's move on with the appellant's presentation then, please. Yes, hello everyone, this is Alex Gore. Um, I'm not able to show my video. Um, it's just not allowing me to. Oh, there we go. It's good seeing you all. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Uh, thank you for extending this. I know that this is a smaller project than the one that you just heard, but it's actually, it's a big deal for the person that's living in there. So I appreciate your time um, and your effort in, in understanding this and, and, and hopefully, um, you know, your opinion and your vote at the end. So Susan, could you bring up my presentation? Certainly, one moment. Perfect, everyone can see that? So to give you, I just wanted to give you a, a visual focus of, of what we're looking at. So this is the front house and behind that fence, it, that blue trim uh, structure is the ADU. And I wanted to show you this picture to show that it is conforming to the size of and the scope of this neighborhood. Um, if you go to the next picture, um, here's a picture, again, that blue trim with that yellow siding right there. There's the ADU in question. This is extremely typical um, of, of the structures in this area within the size and scope, but just to give you a visual idea of what, what we're, we're talking about and it's that structure right there. Can you go to the next slide, please? So the major issues um, is that it's the, an ADU, which is allowed in this zone, is too large in comparison to the front house. Um, it was not properly permitted, we know that, um, and the area is not accurately recorded. And just to boil this down to, to layman's terms. So if you go to the next uh, slide, um, to give some context, this house was built in 1940, and the records have it at 750 square feet. Um, one of the first things that we did is because they didn't have an, an, an ILC that um, was acceptable by the city, we had Andy Patterson, who is a registered surveyor uh, who does hundreds of projects. Um, uh, and I don't, think you could, I don't think you could question his accuracy. Went out and measured it. Um, and it is 1,000, the house is 1,036 square feet, half of which would be 511. So when we're 518. And the ADU that we're proposing is 511. Um, the rear house record is 504, but then Andy Patterson um, verified it at 903. Now, the question of expanding. Gene brought, bought the house in 1987, and the footprint has stayed the same. So, and then let's go to the, the next point. In 1992, she converted the rear garage into an ADU. She did not expand the footprint. She did not expand the footprint of the house or anything like that. So, when this was brought up in 2019, we have to go back and correct something that's happening in 1992. And of course, it's not gonna fall within the guidelines that were made in 2018 when something happened in 1992. Now we're not disputing that she didn't get the right permits um, for it at, at that time, but it has been in this condition and not a problem to the, to the majority of the neighbors during, during that whole time period. So then once Jean was notified of this, she did take the right steps and did start to go through the city and then did hire an architect. And the only reason why for that second uh, violation was basically because of COVID, she had no other place to live. Um, I took some steps uh, talking with some building officials, but also having my engineer go and inspect the building. We had electrical engineers, professional engineers go inspect the building to make sure it was safe. And Jean Jasmine is an elderly lady that had an ADU that's been up since 1992 and did reoccupy it for the purposes of she would be living in her car if she didn't be living in the here. And it's not acceptable 
especially if she has a, a safe place to live that's actually safe, um, that's inspected by professionals to not allow that. But now we're here still continuing this process to try to do the right thing, right? So it's not trying to circumvent it. Everything is, is, is trying to do the proper thing the proper way. It's just hard with the codes and the way that everything happened. Now, between 1940 and 1987, I do not know what happened to the property if things got expanded, but not, uh, not properly permitted or anything like that. I have no idea. I don't know if Gene has any idea, but the footprint stayed the same. Besides on the ADU, I'll show you, there was a garage in the back and then there was a three season porch and that all got enclosed to the ADU. But that three season porch, that whole footprint still stayed the same. She didn't add anything onto it. Um, and then she hired us in December and, and now we're here before you. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> we have a couple of different options. Uh, as you can see in, in gray, is the ADU that fits the records for what exists now, what the surveyor Andy Patterson has documented, which is half the square footage. So you as the commissioners have a couple different options of, of what you can do. And I'm gonna go through the right review criteria and, and how I think we meet that too. Um, but one is if, if the denial is upheld, this is a big question um, because what happens? You know, if the denials with help, do we do you demo it? Does what if the client doesn't have enough money to demo a structure that already exists? Does it stay vacant? Does it go neglected? Um, it's a property that that's there, so we have to face that challenge and deal with it in in a humane but a responsible way. Um, so you could allow it with modifications also. Um, that would be to demo a portion of the structure of the, well, when we have them walled off. So obviously you could approve it with modifications to, to leave it as we kind of presented, or we could demo those areas labeled storage. Um, the problem with that is that you're demoing something that isn't made to be demo. So you're causing uh, more costs and then aesthetically you're making the neighborhood actually more unpleasing to it. Um, to fall within the guidelines too, there's carports. And I believe that you saw those in the first two, two pictures. We could go back and look at those. And then those would comply to the area rules that Zach knows and, and are actually pretty complicated. But um, if you trust Zach numbers and our numbers, those would make everything comply with the structure being 50% less and everything else being 75% less. Um, or you could allow the same footprint that, that existed in 1987 um, and have the ADU remain with or without the walls blocked off. And I'll tell you why that's a concern of choosing to have the walls blocked off or not have them blocked off. Uh, could we go to the next slide? So here is that uh, uh, carport in the back. The reason why I want you to consider keeping the carports is because it snows in Colorado and this house does not have garages. So if we choose to eliminate either one of the carports, which actually no one has a problem with, you're making an elderly lady or an elderly anyone that moves in or a young person, I even shovel off of my car, remove snow off of a car and have it be exposed um, and cause undue burden into a, a, residence, a resident of Longmont that doesn't need to have that burden on there. Um, we don't think that the carports are really an issue with this square foot with the neighbors um, with fitting in context. Uh, next slide, please. And so there, there's the front carport. Again, um, it could be a garage, it could be bigger, um, but it, 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 it's a small little carport um, that isn't an eyesore and, and well done. Uh, next slide, please. So the review criteria, uh, the first one is that it's consistent um, with the comprehensive plan and purpose. Um, and actually, I, I actually wanna quote two points of um, policy from Longmont that, that aren't on this slide, but there's a, pol a Longmont policy 1.2E and it states, anticipate and plan for challenging needs of the community 
and the diverse diversity of the city housing stock by encouraging the development of a range of housing types, size, prices, and densities. So that last sentence of encouraging the development of range of housing, size, prices, and densities, allowing for this ADU falls in line with that. Uh, everyone was at the Bond Farm meeting, and, and, and you might have caught me chuckled because someone said ADUs are, are what Longmont is actually trying to do for a variety of, of different reasons. Um, there's also a goal of Longmont 3.1. Ensure there are affordable and accessible housing options that fit the needs of the residents of all ages, abilities, and income levels. So retrofitting or destroying or demoing or not approving this ADU increases the cost because if you, theoretically, this ADU could be denied. We could demo it and essentially build the same square foot back up in a new more, I mean, obviously it's gonna cost more because you have to rebuild the whole structure, labor uh, shortages uh, still abound. Um, I, I'm a builder here too. So it would be more expensive. So keeping this would actually fall in line within the review criteria one, besides seeking structural size release. So that's what we're looking for is structural size relief. Um, and then accurately recording of the existing structures which I believe we can do by recording the plats that Andy Patterson um, created to update it to, to what, what actually is. Um, point number two, uh, complies with Sydney standards. The main point uh, on the packet was that it didn't because there was a public work comment of that drainage needs to be taken care of. Um, I called Mara and I said, hey, uh, you know, I thought we addressed this. Um, actually, I did it through an email. I go, here's where we address it. And she said, yep, that, uh, that is acceptable no further comments. So review criteria two is actually a check mark that we have checked off. Um, if, could we go to the next slide? Uh, review criteria three is compatible with the existing surroundings properties in terms of its land use. Yes, the site and building layout and design and access. Um, so again, it's only fixing the size, the size uh, between the ADU and the existing house. But please note that there's a picture of this, uh, an area of view for a reason. And that's because it would, if, if you didn't know where the site was, and if you had to pick which one was, which one of these houses were overbuilt, which one of these lots had too much, Gene Jasmine's would be one of the last ones that you pick. And that's because some person with more money could buy her lot, could tear it down, rebuild a bigger house, and then rebuild the same size or a bigger ADU. And that would be compatible with the city guidelines. So something larger than what exists right now would be considered compatible. So just because there's a small house in front, and that's making this back house not compatible. But I want you to keep that in mind when you're making uh, your decision that a larger thing could be in place. So thus, it's compatible with the, with the neighborhood in the size and its scope. Um, the city did say that partial use of the structure for the accelerated dressing, uh, dwelling unit may not be the most logical way. And that goes with um, all the neighbors' comments. So what we proposed doing was basically blocking it off um, so that she's only using 511 square feet. The negative comments that we got, the theme was that, you know, she built illegally, which we're trying to adjust, and that she might expand into those other areas, right? So you could approve this with just approving the whole ADU, thus that wouldn't be an issue, that she wouldn't be in compliance of expanding into those if the ADU itself is approved. I also want to note that there was three letters against it, but there was 14 letters for it. There was 14 letters, some of them long, some of them uh, very well written in support of this versus the, versus the three that were not in support. Um, number four, the application does not ad adversely affect surrounding properties uh, and the natural environment. Um, I believe that this is a big point and the city agrees that um, that we've uh, met this criteria. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? 
And, it, and the next slide points out that uh, point 0.5 and 6 are moot. They, they really don't apply with, with what's going on here. Um, so review criteria one, especially with the policies and the goals of what the city is trying to make and trying to have as a community, I think we meet that. Number two was the drainage issue that, that we solved. Number three was the, the size, um, you know, fit within the context of the, uh, of the city. And if you could build something bigger, something smaller obviously fits. Um, number four, uh, what was number four? Number four, the city agreed with us. Uh, and number five and six don't count. So we ask that Planning and Zoning Commission vote to allow the structure to be used as an ADU, which it legal, which an ADU is permitted. And then we'll go to the building department and get the building permits for it um, in its existing size while allowing the other structures to remain. Um, so I'll leave it at that. That's our presentation. Again, I thank you for, for staying up and considering this because it is a it is a, at least a big, big issue to at least one person. Thank you, Mr. Gore. Um, we will move on to the public hearing part of this. Um, and we need to go through our process of uh, allowing people to call in. So Susan, if we can put that up on our screen, thank you. Um, if you want to call in and, and make a comment on this item, please call 1-888-788-0098. Uh, when you reach that phone number, uh, the meeting ID is 862-0295-7430. So call 1-888-788-0099, enter in 862-0295-7430. You need about five minutes to take care of all the technicalities with this, so we'll take a five-minute break. Thank you.
chair will wait for the live stream slide to disappear. Looks like we've got five people waiting. I'm going to let them in. Okay. So welcome to the callers tonight. Give us just a minute and then we will call you one by one by the last three digits of your phone number. Please stop listening to the live stream. You may miss the opportunity when I try to call on you. So if you reduce the volume on the live stream, that may help. And looks like we're ready. I'll begin with the first caller. Your phone number ends in 744. I'm going to ask you to unmute caller 744. Hello there. Hello. My name is, hi. <laughs> I'm guessing I unmuted successfully. So yep. my name is Chris Mills. I live at 207 Lincoln Street. Also at the request of our neighbors who are essential workers and have a very early morning, they're in healthcare. Uh, they asked me to act as their proxy tonight. They live at 214 Lincoln. Their names are Melora and Ryan DeMockmet. Thank you for allowing me this time to, to share my thoughts on Ms. Jasmine's appeal. I'm going to be brief, it's very late. We're all a little bit tired and I'm pretty sure we need about a ninth inning stretch here. Uh, first, I'd like to say for the record, I am not particularly against ADUs as a general rule. In fact, not that long ago, an ADU was approved just about a block north of here, of uh, this subject property, which is right across the street from me. Adhering to code and complying with all the appropriate regulations, it was approved and then the structure was converted. It was not a retroactive request. I think this is actually great, in line with Longmont's density goals and respectful of process and law. When I wanted to put a new roof on my house, I pulled a permit. When I wanted to upgrade my electrical service, I pulled a permit. When I wanted to put up a white picket fence, something I have always wanted and not quite done with it yet, uh, I pulled a permit. And when I wanted to enrich both the neighborhood and my own property value by removing the 40 year old dilapidated vinyl siding and replacing with a new age appropriate exterior on this incredibly cute Longmont classic home, I pulled a permit. Shouldn't we all be held to that same standard? Shouldn't we all have to comply with the rules and regulations set forth and ratified by the community as a standard for all of us? Acceptance of this proposal in any form would set an unwarranted precedent that permits are not truly necessary. Has this structure in question been modified and expanded responsibly and legally according to code and with the proper permits? And had Ms. Jasmine for the past 30 years contributed appropriately to the community in line with the actual use of this structure, we would not be sitting here today. I would not be up past midnight having this discussion with this commission. There would be no question, but this is not the case. As someone pointed out in one of the support letters that I read in the packet, the structure has been in place since 1987 and rented out since then. While Ms. Jasmine, who up until just a few years ago was living remotely in Juneau, Alaska, had rented out both dwellings and two others, incidentally, at 211 Lincoln right across the street, which is adjacent to my property. Again, no evidence that the modifications and expansions were ever done legally, no record of the fundamental changes that were made to the property anywhere. The implications are clear. In closing, Ms. Jasmine should have complied with and abided by all codes and regulations, just like the rest of us must. From that day, she decided to convert a garage into a dwelling. She forfeited her opportunity to go back in time when she knowingly and with clear intent disregarded this responsibility, this requirement. In my four and a half years here living next door to Ms. Jasmine and her many, many revolving door renters, she has never been a person you could take at her word. So please, please don't accept her promises going forward. I wanna see actions, not words. Compliance isn't a choice. 
In the interest of maintaining the integrity of our neighborhood and our community, it must be compulsory. And I want to add one thing. I wasn't really, it wasn't really planned tonight, but I'm going to say just one more thing. This notion of Ms. Jasmine having to live in a car and COVID and all this, I'm sorry, she just sold the house next door for more than $400,000, scot-free, does not owe anything. So I wonder, I, I just wonder, where does this story start and end? I strongly support the director's decision in this matter, and I hope that this commission upholds that decision today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mills. Um, Susan, who's next? We're going to unmute 907, 907, there you are. Hi, my name is Ron Elms and I live at 215 Lincoln Street. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I do apologize for adding to the commission's already long evening. Um, I'd like to say first that I've lived in Boulder County nearly all of my life and in Longmont since 1982. And prior to this, I've had no difficulties getting along with neighbors previous to my current situation. I now live across the street from 210 Lincoln, the property with a proposed ADU. And for 18 years, from 2002 until two days ago, I lived next door to a property owned by Jean Jasmine at 211 Lincoln Street, which she's just sold. I also purchased my house at 215 Lincoln Street from Ms. Jasmine. Perhaps more than any other neighbor, therefore, I think I have plentiful and difficult experience in living next to and living with consequences from the actions of the property owner in this appeal. I will not go into great detail except to say that I've had no choice but to watch over the years as a fairly regular stream of workmen and the owner herself have engaged in any number of projects to expand, alter, and improve the properties next to and across from me without ever demonstrating evidence of a permit. All this so that the back houses, as she calls them, could be rented without proper permission or approval from the city. Nevertheless, my objections to this proposed ADU are not of a personal nature. The character, gender, age, and special circumstances of the applicant should have no bearing on the case because this decision will directly affect not only her, but also her neighbors, and indeed, all city residents who are required to secure the proper authorizations to make changes on their homes. If an exception is made in this situation, what will prevent any future homeowner from making unpermitted changes, pleading ignorance after the fact, and citing this case as a precedent? I would also say I am not opposed to accessory dwelling units, even those in my neighborhood, even one next door, if done properly. For example, when an illegal structure is demolished and a new one built. I recognize, accept, and even applaud the city's 2018 change in policy to allow more ADUs in appropriately zoned areas. I also applaud the efforts of the Planning and Development Services and Code Enforcement to make sure that any work done on an ADU is both legally permitted and conforming. According to documents, neither applies to the back structure at 210 Lincoln. For all these reasons, I hope that this appeal will be denied so that the efforts of the director and members of code enforcement will not be undermined. Lastly, I appreciate those who would make a distinction between holding someone to the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law, or in this case, the letter of the code or the spirit of the code. But in this instance, on not one but two properties, the owner was, for her own benefit, violating both the letter and the spirit in a way that directly and negatively impacted her immediate neighbors, including myself as a neighbor. Rewarding such long-term behavior would provide a problem-causing model for other homeowners in long run. Of course, any compassionate person would feel sorry for Ms. Jasmine if she experiences difficult times as a result of this situation. I do, but she has brought these difficulties on herself. 
the neighbors who are only trying to protect the quality of their own lives have not done this to her. And the city functionaries who are tasked with upholding compliance and not pers- are not themselves persecuting anyone. They're only looking out for and protecting the greater good. They deserve our thanks, and I offer them mine. And I thank you all as well for hearing me tonight and for all your time and efforts. Good night. Mr. Elms, before you hang up, can you hold on for a second? Um, sure. Commissioner Height. Yeah. Commissioner Height. I got to ask you, Gina, a question. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, ask, ask you, Gina. We don't normally question uh, callers or public hearing. So oh, that, yeah. that's what I wanted to talk to Mr. May about quickly. Okay. Eugene. Uh, my name is not Eugene. I don't know. Uh, I know. I know, Mr. Holmes. I just wanted you not yeah. to hang up yet. I, I don't have oh, a question okay. for you until I talk to okay. City Attorney May. Okay. Which is Eugene uh, yeah. for Mr. May. This gentleman seems to have evidence that might be directly relevant here. Am I allowed to ask more questions of this person? I know it's not typical, but this isn't typical. Uh, it's a public hearing to present evidence. These are the public providing testimony. Um, that That's generally not uh, what I've seen uh, in the context of these hearings or, or city council hearings. Right, it's a, it's a different type of thing. And, and if we're bringing in more evidence, and, and, and I guess there's the opportunity of both the city and the applicant or, or the appellant to rebut this, is this information, if, if this gentleman has potentially directly relevant information that he says he saw, which I would like to ask him more about, um, to supplement this record or to make this record more full, um, I'd like to go down that road. You know, ultimately, I do think it's a determination by the chair. I, I, I don't think that it's a um, typical procedure in uh, these land use hearings to question uh, members of the public who participate in the public hearing. Right. I have, in 10 years serving on planning and zoning, I have never witnessed us once going through a Q&A during the public hearing. That's I, that's why I cut you off so sharply, Commissioner Height. No, I understand, and I wasn't going to ask questions without going through this process first. Yeah. Um, to stay consistent with how this commission has always worked, uh, I think we need to stay consistent with um, with not doing Q and A with uh, the public during the public hearing part of of our meetings. So uh, okay. thank, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak this evening and I appreciate all of your efforts. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Elms. Um, Susan, let's move on. I think it's number 962. That's correct. Caller 962. Do you hear us? I'm gonna ask you to unmute. 962. There you are. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We sure can. You may begin. Uh, this is Peter Spalding at 113 Spruce Avenue, uh, developer for Bond Farm. I would just like to uh, talk about the character of Jean Jasmine. She is one of the most giving individuals I know, and she's probably one of the very few people in our community that actually works for the Bond Farm Neighborhood Association and trying to bring people together to do community events. For the Bond Farm Neighborhood Park, she's been an active member in helping to clean and to organize people to come and care for the park itself. Um, I know some of the adversity that she's gone through with her neighbors, um, while some of it's justified, um, I think that those neighbors need to look at their own properties as well as for, as for compliance issues too. I think Alex Gore brings up a really good point uh, regarding the fact that that property could be scraped and something much larger could be brought in. Um, you know, it could be a five bedroom 
uh, house with an ADU unit. Um, so I think what she's doing is very hidden. You can't, it's very concealed. You can't see the unit from either side of the road. And uh, the tenant that uh, lives in the existing structure in front of her property or the ADU that she's uh, going for, um, they get along really well. And I think um, the 14 letters of support indicate how well uh, Jean is accepted in the neighborhood. Um, I'm just gonna keep this short, but I support um, Alex and Jean's uh, proposal and um, I hope to see a positive outcome come from this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spalding. Um, next is number 128. Caller 128, I'm asking to have you unmute yourself. Can you hear me? 128. Make sure you've stopped the live stream. Caller 128. Can you unmute? There you are. Do you hear us? Caller 128, looks like you just unmuted. Hello. Oh. Looks like she or he just muted themselves again and unmuted. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? I can see that you look like you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Hi, um, my name is Brad Campbell. Um, I live at 16270 Ocean View Drive in Juneau, Alaska. I am Jean Jasmine's uh, son. Now she made the mistake of turning the garage into living space without for, for first permitting it. You know, that she has done. Um, I would like to comment though um, on you know, where she's, what she's done, you know, having um, those rental properties. She spent years down in Mexico volunteering at orphanages and um, a program called Casa de Esperanza allows poor kids from villages to come into the city and pursue education. She's put in numerous years in tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars into volunteering and helping poor kids down in Mexico. Um, so my mother is 76 years old and she has some health issues, which makes her especially at risk for contracting the coronavirus. Um, Jean needs a safe place to live and you know, she deserves a safe place to live. Um, I'm going to keep this short and um, I ask the planning commission to please work with Jean and improve her ADU. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um, okay, Susan, do we have any other callers? No, Chair, that was it. Okay, okay I'll close the, uh, the public hearing and it looks like we go to questions and discussion uh, amongst the commission. Um, quick question for city attorney May, just on, on our process here. Um, normally, uh, when we do questions and discussion, um, commissioners can address a question to whomever they wish, um, the applicant, the applicant's representatives, um, you know, city staff. Um, are there any guidelines in an, in an appeal scenario as we have tonight uh, that you want us to adhere to? Oops, uh, you're, you're muted. 
Chair Chernak. City Attorney Eugene May here. No, uh, those same procedures would apply here. It's a de novo hearing. Uh, staff um, and the applicant are here to clarify and expand upon their presentations. Uh, they will have a chance to rebut the evidence presented as a sort of separate section of the agenda, but for purposes of uh, commission discussion, commissioners are free to um, question the parties. And, and just to be clear, after that rebuttal period by the applicant, the commission does no further discussion after that. Uh, they can, if there's a motion, there can be um, debate on the motion. Usually the evidentiary portion of the hearing is closed at that point. And then if there's any additional augmentation of the record, then uh, staff and the appellant would have an opportunity to rebut that or respond um, in line with due process. Okay. All right. Keep us on track. No, you're, you're doing a great job. Okay. Um, any questions from the commission? Commissioner Height. Mr. Schumacher, um, is the issue the size of the principal unit and the size of the assessor unit and the size of the additional assessor units on site? Is that the main issue? Other than it, I think there's a drainage problem that may or may not have been addressed. But as I'm looking at this, I'm looking at square footages and making numbers work. Is that the problem? Mr. Hyde, yes, that's my understanding is the primary issue is related to the size of the structures and the fact that parts of the structures or some of the structures never got building permits. So the, the, part two, um, there's a disparity between the sizes measured in the field versus sizes reported in Boulder County's assessor records, um, suggesting as somebody may have witnessed or may not have witnessed that this particular building had been expanded without permits. When a building is expanded without permits, is that correctable? Um, Chairman Chernak, Commissioner Height, I think I will step into this conversation. Uh, Joni Marsh, Assistant City Manager. Um, so certainly there are options to correct, which is why we um, condemned and had the ADU um, removed previously because it was not built with building permits. As the commission knows, the city adopts codes to ensure life safety. We certainly want all our residents to live in uh, dwelling units that are properly permitted. And in the case of this ADU, um, that was not the case. And I would suggest to the council or the planning commission to remember that we're talking about denial of a site plan waiver. And that denial to Commissioner Height's point is based on the language that you will see on page seven of your staff report, which talks about the total floor area. And you'll note that they use the mandatory language, which is shall meet those percentages. And, and in all three of those, all of the percentages are not met in that mandatory size requirement. We certainly could work with the applicant in a different format, but certainly not in a site plan waiver process to look at other options to remedy, but the site plan waiver is not the remedy and that is why it has been denied. Well, that is exactly part of what my question is. So how does someone solve a problem of having illegally built something? Is it fixable? Possibly not in this format. Um, so the denial, I, I wanna make sure I understand this, or, or, or the rejection or the upholding of the rejection of this um, this, this waiver um, doesn't foreclose the appellant and applicant from skinning this cat from a, with a different knife. Um, she could come in and go through full site plan review after and, and get her buildings fixed and qualify for an ADU. Is that correct? Chairman Chernak and Commissioner Hyatt. So there may be a couple of other remedies via a site plan approval um, and proper building permits, which um, in this case, I would suggest proper building permitting um, is actually first and foremost, the most important thing for anyone living in a home. Um, 
so there are a couple avenues um, for the size of Ms. Jasmine's property that we could look at potentially. Mm -hmm. And certainly this is not the venue to promise that those options would work, which may be things like, would a duplex be allowed and there be some attachment? There's two homes. And I think uh, Mr. Gore makes a great point. We want housing in our community, uh, but I don't think blocking off two rooms and suggesting their storage makes an, um, for good housing, nor does it make for long-term enforcement um, potential for staff. That certainly opens the doors for subsequent buyers to continue to change the format of those buildings and get us back to really where we are here today, which all started, um, I think, as you read from code enforcement. So there may be an avenue via duplex, and there's also some, there were also some changes in this particular zoning district from the old code to the new code, where you could actually have two principal dwelling units on a property. So there would be some room for discussion around those options. But to make sure I understand this, the waiver of site plan review is being denied because there's, they can't show compliance with existing code um because she the, the structures are illegally built i think i follow that thank you um i'm gonna possibly be asking the same question so uh Joni, please bear with me but I, i'm gonna put it in different terms so um i need to understand um somebody comes to you and says we want a site plan waiver. So they're, they're asking to not go through site plan review. If you deny the waiver, can they then turn around and do the site plan review? The reason I'm asking is because it seems like everybody in these letters is saying that if we uphold the denial of the site plan waiver, that the only option is demolition. Chairman Chernak, so I can appreciate that folks writing in might think that is the case. However, I would state that is not the case. Okay, so the appellant would have the opportunity to proceed with the city by going through a full site plan review and not ask for a waiver of, of that process. I would say there is potential to explore other avenues to get approval for an accessory dwelling unit. However, I can't say this evening that that would for sure be approved sure. administratively either or um, be an absolute yes. However, we are not approving the waiver simply because it can't meet the code statements and percentage requirements. Right. Um, let me phrase the question another way. Um, if the denial of the site plan waiver is upheld by this commission, does that force the applicant out onto the street? Currently, the applicant does not have a certificate of occupancy to occupy the structure. We certainly empathize with Ms. Jasmine and understand that she currently is uh, seeking a place to live and our building official and our code enforcement staff have been working to make sure that we aren't turning her out into the street, I think is um, um, certainly where we're at. However, there is not a, a certificate of occupancy at this point that would state that you could live there indefinitely. Okay. One thing I don't understand is that all this discussion is about the ADU and Miss Jasmine living in the ADU, but she's the owner of the property. Why is she not living in the primary house? Perhaps that's best answer. That might be a applicant. question for the applicant. Yes. Mr. Gore, Ms. Jasmine, can you answer my question? Yes. Yes, I can. Um, the, um, I want to, say that the people that were um, opposed to my uh, having an ADU or ADUs said that I did it for my own benefit. Um, and I want to just let you know that I've been a volunteer all my life. 
in my home for orphans in Mexico, in uh, Red Cross, and in Habitat for Humanity. I have volunteered my time and my money. And that's what I've used those um, uh, the money for, always. And um, I have um, I have a renter, a tenant, very uh, good tenant in the front house in at 210. And I um, need that income for uh, just living. I have always lived very, very simply. Um, and uh, I just want a simple place for myself to live and not have to uh, evict a very good tenant that needs that house too. So um, if I don't get to live in the back house, in the, if the ADU is, is not approved, I will have to go and find something else um, because um, I think you can, hear the anger of my neighbors who complained. Um, it's not a, a good place for me to be, just health-wise. And um, this 14 neighbors that approved or supported me were very, um, it's, that was very good to hear. So I would go find a place to live somewhere else where there's more positive energy. That's how I can answer that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I know another commissioner had a, had a question. Uh, commissioner Oneron. Well, I kind of, I kind of got the answers. Uh, it's a very tough situation the commission is in right now. Uh, I personally respect the city's willingness to really apply the standards and stick with it. But at the same time, I asked the question, what the standard is. When I read this rule for the first time, I questioned it. And this is a perfect example why I questioned it. If you double the front house square footage today, if you put a second floor and make it 2,000 square feet or 24,000 square feet house, you're making the ADU compliant. And I asked that question, why it, that, does that make sense? It doesn't. And that's why I'm kind of split up now. I feel the abs absurdity of the rule but also I feel like, you know, we need to comply to the rule because the rule is legal. And that's the way we control the development. So I don't know, <laughs> I just wanted to put that out. Am I right to say that if you double the square footage of the front house, the back would be Compliant? Let's address that to Brian Schumacher, that question. Yeah, so that, that would be one option um, is to expand the existing principal structure to have that to be larger than one half of the square footage of the accessory dwelling unit. So my question is that why does that make sense? Well, I think the purpose of the standard uh, applies more often in residential single family neighborhoods than perhaps a residential mixed neighborhood where duplexes might be allowed. And the standard applies across the board to all residential zoning districts where there's single family detached structures. And the intent was to limit the size of the accessory dwelling unit so it wouldn't uh, be out of character with the single family neighborhood.
Commissioner Flagg. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't often say while working in Denver, but I have to in this situation. I know I hate to bring that up, but sometimes if you do not have a certificate of occupancy required, people end up moving into places that are really not habitable, really not. And that's why it's important to have a certificate of occupancy. It protects people. So if we're denying that someone can go ahead and just live in a place that has not been permitted and gone through all the correct reviews that you and I, I, I think I, I can speak, that you and I think should be there to protect all, all of us so that we all have good housing, you end up with situations that are just horrid, where people have nowhere to turn, and then the zoning departments or inspections has to basically step in and shut down a place because COs are not issued, or the dwelling place is simply not appropriate for human habitation. So my tendency is to say, look for another remedy, but uphold the decision of the Planning Development Services Director because we have to have certain kinds of standards so that we make sure that we have living spaces that are appropriate, and that we can defend as being habitable. That's part of our responsibility too. Commissioner Goldberg. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Onrun, I echo your frustration in recognizing that we're in a conundrum here. And Commissioner Flagg, I appreciate your perspective on uh, standing by the rule of law and recognizing that they're there uh, for a reason, they're in place for a reason. Uh, two quick clarifying questions, um, actually for City Attorney May, um, if you're available. Hey, here. Eugene. Quick question. Um, we received several um, notes of support speaking to our app, the, the appellant's character. Um, all of the speaking to some of the good that she's done, uh, her volunteerism and other qualities that are um, outstanding. Is uh, a person's character something that we should be considering in this review process today? Uh, Chairman and Commission, uh, you know, this appeal is about the application of the code to a site plan waiver application. And I would encourage and advise the commission to apply the code criteria as they uh, appear in our ordinance. Um, that, is, that is the law uh, for the city of Longmont and uh, you know, character and policy considerations are not code. Um, those, those are decisions for policymakers, um, and the, that isn't really the role of the commission in this context, in this forum. Okay, thanks. Well, just one more for you. Are we, how about previous violations? Are those uh, something that we should take into consideration when reviewing um, this project? Uh, again, I, I think I would say pretty much what I said in my first response, that this is a site plan waiver application to be measured against the code criteria. Um, you know, I think that uh, part of the role of the commission is to weigh the credibility of witnesses and evidence. And that may factor in, you know, that that is, that is your role as a commission. Uh, but you're looking at the evidence presented against the criteria of the code and making your determination. Did, did that answer your question? Thank 100%. Thanks, Mr. May. Uh, 
Yeah, I guess, um, you know, just to drop a seed with the rest of the commission. Um, yeah, this, this is sticky for sure. Uh, we can, uh, you know, I start inclined to uh, and defer to our city staff as the experts most of the time. And uh, their decision making weighs heavy on me, and 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 it inspires me, anyways. Um, but um, you know, we're here to uh, evaluate that review and and those decisions made. So um, I recognize that as a challenge. And on the flip side, um, I'm able to turn to the public contributions today. Uh, you know, some of the feedback really resonated. Uh, that we need to make sure that we're holding everyone to the same standard. Um, compliance isn't a choice. Uh, we're at the risk of setting a precedent. Um, perhaps uh, the reason why we're in this position uh, and the reason why the um, appellant is here today was from decisions that were self-imposed. And so, I think I'll stop there and turn to the rest of the commission for a discussion and before I can make any stands here. Commissioner Onoran. Sorry, I'm a little bit frustrated, but my frustration comes from this question that we're being asked. You're basically asking us, us if it is okay not to get occupancy permit. Obviously it's not okay. And if that's the question you're asking us, that's redundant. You shouldn't ask that question. It's not okay. <laughs> but if this is an appeal coming to us, I would assume that you're asking about the rule itself. It is obvious that the rule is not complied. But my frustration comes from there's something really absurd about the rule. <laughs> and what we're denying from the applicant, to me at least, in my heart, is unfair. Even though she doesn't have permit for occupancy, which is wrong. So that's why my dilemma is like, why are we being asked this question this way? <laughs> Creates my frustration. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Gore. Uh, thank you for allowing me to respond because I think this is the crux of the question. And especially the crux since the uh, people that oppose it brought it up and made a good point about permits and precedents. And we aren't asking the question whether we should not get permits or whether this should be a precedence because the way that this has to be followed is that we have to go through planning and zoning first to then go to the building department, which we've already engaged with, to get the, the permits, which uh, the commissioner brought up, will help ensure that it, this is a safe structure, that this is a structure that someone can live in. Now, the, the issue comes up in, 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 in two ways, actually. One, we've, you know, I hate to bring up Denver too. We've done hundreds of houses in Denver and it goes in the same process of going through the planning and zoning. And we've never had this weird denial because what it probably should have been is adjust this, change this, keep modifying until we get the correct answer. But this is a denial which and, and I think, honestly, it's a denial because we are then recommended to go to this committee because you are all human beings. And sometimes we see the there are flaws in, in the code. No code can be perfect. And no code can take in every single situation. And it's does what doing, if you think what's right, trumps the actual technicalities, which we know that we can't meet, which we are trying to remedy. And to think that is, this is gonna set a, a precedence of, of allowing people to do this, I can tell you that this is the harder way to do it. And I know that because we've done it before where this has happened. It's never gotten to this commission, but 
this is not a position that anyone wants to get in. This is not a risk anyone wants to take. Even in, in building, you know, when the inspectors come by, you don't even want to hide something, even if you think you can get away with it, because if you get caught, you're screwed. So what I'm what we are essentially asking you and and what we heard from planning and zoning is to literally bring this up to you guys for your decision, because this rule does not make sense in this certain case, this, this square footage thing, because then we can go after this to the building department. And it has been kind of messy and frustrating because we've been asked from the city who I have to admit are pretty great. We've worked with a long time, but they kept questioning us. How are you going to get your, uh, why don't you have your permits? We can't, we can't approve this. You don't have permits. We have to go through planning and zoning before we can get permits. So I, I really, I don't know if I'm summing this up correctly. But I think it goes to um, the point that was just being made that, that I followed. It goes to this one question is, are you allowed to make the decision when things don't make sense? And I was in the army and you are supposed to follow rules, but you know when you're not supposed to follow certain rules and you don't, and you are not supposed to cross those lines. And this isn't equivalent to that, that's at another level, but we're dealing with a similar situation where if you had to write a code and, and remedy this where it would be something like a house under so many square footage can have more than 50%. Great. That would remedy this code. That isn't here, right? If you're, you're, if we're trying to answer the question, how does a 1992 house that's built in 1992 apply to codes made in 2018? It doesn't. It doesn't apply to those codes. But that doesn't mean that we, that you can't make the decision that the square footage is, is allowed and is uh, something that doesn't burden this community, actually helps property values, fits within the context, and then we can move on to the building, the building permit where we address those health, safety, and welfare issues. Thank you. Commissioner Height. Um, respectfully, I think Ms. Jasmine and Mr. Gore here are under are here under the wrong procedure. Um, they've requested a waiver from the director. There are certain standards that have to be met to obtain that waiver from the director. The director says that they don't meet the standards. If you look at the standards, um, you know, 1502070C3, you have to comply with 1502055 and 150552 says you're in compliance with all city standards. They're not. They don't have a certificate of occupancy. They don't meet the square footage. The director's decision to deny the waiver was correct. That doesn't mean that Ms. Jasmine doesn't have another means by which to correct her problems, which is to not seek the waiver, go through full site plan review. Frankly, my two cents is the same thing. I don't understand why we're here with an appeal and there are other options. Commissioner Poland. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Hyten and, and you, uh, Commissioner Chairperson Chernick. Um, <clears throat> we are not here to change a code that was written. That's, we're, we're not to debate whether the code is right or wrong. That's for another time. That's for somebody else to take up another challenge or there's another process for that. We are to apply the code to this situation. Applying the code to this situation means that we, for me, it means that we uphold the planning and zoning's decision to deny the certificate of waiver. Applicant Jasmine does have another or several other ways that she can approach this. There are some first steps that they can take to try to rectify some things. They can maybe even approach to see if, if the code can be changed at some future date. But for this date, we have our code and that's what we have to follow. Commissioner Goldberg. 
Yeah, uh, nicely put, Commissioner Poland. I appreciate that uh, summary and um, the perspective from Commissioner Hyde as well. Uh, so I think with that, um, and again, looking for any red flags, if, it, if we're not allowed to make a motion at this time, but I, I think we're okay. Um, I'd be inclined to move that we uphold the decision of the Planning and Development Services Director finding that the site plan waiver application does not meet the review criteria, which it doesn't. Um, let's go to City Attorney May. Let's make sure we're, we're in proper procedure. Chairman Chernak, you read my mind, so I'm, I'm looking at the list. Um, it sounded like there was rebuttal by uh, staff and the appellant. Uh, maybe you want to just formalize it and make sure that they've had that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And, then, yep. and um, then the other comment with the motion, if um, the commission may want to uh, adopt one of the PZRs in the packet as, as their written findings. Okay, thank you, Attorney May. Um, Commissioner Teta, let's uh, let's proceed with with, with your comments. Uh, we'll get back to Commissioner Goldberg's motion. You need to unmute yourself, please. Uh, I'd just like to second. Okay. Um, yep, I could. Okay. Well, well, well. Before we get to the second, we need to figure out it. exactly what the motion is. Um, but um, uh, let's let's do this. Um, we need to have oh, Commissioner Height, please. No, I'm just telling you not to forget to request the rebuttal. That's what I was just going to do. Thank you. Um, we need to have a formal uh, chance for rebuttal from uh, the applicant or her her representative. Mr. Gore, Ms. Jasmine? Yep, I'll only say one thing and then turn it over to Ms. Jasmine because I think that you guys have heard my perspective. The only thing I wanted to clarify is that we did not go in requesting uh, site plan review wavering. This was the process the city told us to do. And the reason why I wanted to make that clarification is because I don't want you guys to think that we came in trying to skirt some sort of rules. We went into the city sat down with them, asked them what process should we do. This was where we were direct, directed. We came to this, asked what process should we now do, and then we're directed to this, to this meeting. I just want to make that clear that we weren't trying to waive something or, or, or try to uh, underskirt anything. It was in conversation with them um, and, and, and in direction with them. Jean? Ms. Jasmine? Well, I totally acknowledge and totally regret that I did not get permits when I um, remodeled the garage into a dwelling. Um, and I want to make that right. Also, I want to make it clear because the square footage argument, I, I don't know if everyone understands, I did not increase the square footage of either the front house or the garage. <clears throat> remodeled the inside of them and um, so I, I don't know if that makes a difference but um, that's and, and last thing just for your consideration because we have spent so much time on this the square footage is, is correct if we block off those other two rooms that's right. That, that, that's literally what all of this work is coming down to. B besides that, we would have to submit to the county that these are the correct square footages um, because by the uh, surveyor. So that's the heart of the issue. And if, I'll, am I still sure. on? If we, if I can have the square footage of the, the uh, con garage conversion without those two other rooms that I've blocked off and will not use. And if we have to tear those off of the building, um, I'll do that. Uh, and if I have to eliminate other structures on the property, I'll do that. 
it seems a shame, but um, I did not get permits for them. I put the money in needy places and I just didn't do it. So I regret that. I ask for some kind of leniency and understanding and to help with this situation. Anything further, Mr. Gore, Ms. Jasmine? Not just that I do respect the city's need to have rules and regulations and I don't deny um, that they're very important. And uh, I've had a structural engineer come through the house and, and approve it as being um, a, a totally livable. Uh, also an electrical engineer and a plumber um, engineer that have all said everything is up to code and standard. It's not a bad place to live at all. So. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Goldberg, um, you had started to talk about a motion um, as we've been advised by City Attorney May, more specificity with that. Chairman, an opportunity for uh, staff oh, for rebuttal. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, staff rebuttal. Uh, yep, okay, thank you. Sorry. City Attorney May. Chairman Chernak and members of council. Gosh, I am so backwards. From, I was here last night at 11 o'clock too. Sorry, I'm not with it. So commissioners, staff like the commission are obligated to follow the policy that is adopted. And in this instance, the standards and the criteria and the policies that are currently adopted were not met. And I believe the applicant has indicated that they acknowledge that those criteria are not met in addition to building codes not being followed. Um, and with that, I don't have anything further. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, so now I believe we can proceed with a discussion about a motion. Commissioner Goldberg. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just uh, go ahead and uh, resubmit the motion with, I think, the proper um, identification. Um, I think what I'm recommending, or what I'm motioning to approve PZR 2020-6A, which is a resolution of the Planning and Zoning Commission to uphold the Planning and Development Service Director's decision to deny a site plan waiver application for 210 Lincoln Street. Uh, Commissioner Teta. And I'd like to second. Okay. So motion to approve PZR 2020-6A um, has been moved and uh, seconded. Is there any further discussion about this motion? City Attorney May, can the discussion be from the applicant? I believe it's only amongst the commission. You are correct, Chairman. Okay. The evidentiary portion of the hearing I would consider to be over. It is amongst uh, discussion amongst the commission and then a vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, seeing no, no further discussion about the motion, let's take a vote. Those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Those opposed, any abstentions? Okay, Jane, that passes unanimously seven to zero. Um, now, I do not have a, um, any sort of uh, announcement to read and city attorney may, uh, usually I make some sort of statement about what steps would be from here, but we are the final, dec decision, yeah, final decision body or final deciding body. Um, do you want to clarify for everybody who's still present um, as to what might happen from this point uh, or what, what the applicant could do? Uh, Chairman Chernak, uh, you are correct. You are the final decision maker here, appealable only to a court of competent jurisdiction. 
Um, it did sound like uh, Assistant City Manager Marsh was suggesting a conversation about uh, proper options. Um, and I will have to say, I, I don't know what all those options are, uh, but I think we saw some of the limitation of the site plan waiver process and that there are other processes that um, may yield better results. Okay, thank you. Um, we still, okay, that concludes this item. Uh, we still have more to our agenda, which includes a um, final call for the public invited to be heard. So, um, Susan, we need to put our, um, oh, thank you, Mr. Gore. Thank you, Ms. Jasmine. Uh, appreciate your time. I know it's late. Um, and uh, we're gonna proceed with our, uh, the rest of our agenda. Um, Susan, could we put the slide up that shows the, uh, the phone number for people to call in on if they want to uh, speak about something that was not on tonight's agenda? The phone number to call is 1-888-788-0099. Enter the meeting ID 862-0295-7430. So again, call 1-888-788-0099, enter in the ID 862-0295-7430. We'll take a five minute break to let all the magic electrons do their thing. <laughs> 
Susan, I don't know if you're still there. I lost track of time, so I don't know how close we are to five minutes. Feels like five minutes to me. <laughs> yeah, we're probably close. <coughs> we'll just wait for the slide to clear the stream. Okay. Looks like we've only got six people watching now. And I know a couple of our staff are on that. So I am not seeing anybody, Chair. Okay, great. Thank you, Susan. So we're closing the uh, final call, public invited to be heard. Um, any items from the commission? Commissioner Goldberg. I think I just wanted to say that man, this ain't always easy. Um, you know, despite being late, despite having, you know, so many um, projects before us where we can, you know, virtually high five at the end and know that we did a good thing. Sometimes we get projects like the one before us just that we just finished, but somehow, you know, you did the right thing, but it feels real bad. Um, but I wanted to thank the commission for a good discussion and uh, I think coming up with the right decision. Anything else from the commission? Thank you, Commissioner Goldberg. Uh, any items from Council Representative uh, Aaron Rodriguez? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Cernick. Whew, what a barn burner. Tell you what, the commission does not disappoint. Uh, and there's definitely a lot of uh, very good points brought up tonight on both uh, topics that I think the council will have to address at one point or another. Obviously, the Bone Farm project will be coming before council. And then also looking at our ADU rules is definitely of great interest to the council. I believe an email was actually already sent to city manager Dominguez from the mayor asking specifically for uh, uh, agenda item concerning ADUs. So I'll definitely be able to hopefully relay uh, some of the questions that the, the commission has uh, when we have that discussion. So thank you again so much for your service. Thank you very much. Any items from planning manager Joni Marsh? Chairman Chernick, commissioners, thank you for a late evening. I appreciate all your hard work. Um, we will have a meeting next month. Um, I think right now we only have one item on the agenda, so hopefully it won't be a, a 1246-er. Have a good rest yeah. of your evening. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Um, want to extend a special thank, thanks to Jane Madrid and uh, Heather McDonald and uh, Susan Wallach for running everything behind the scenes. Uh, we really truly can't do it without you. And you're staying up just as late as us. So really appreciate it. Jane just sent me an email saying, good morning, Commissioner Schernick. Here are the <laughs> PZRs to sign. So, um, all right, unless I hear from anybody uh, uh, saying no, we are adjourned. Have a good night, all. Good night.